Good day, everyone, and welcome to this session of the World Technology Universities Network Congress. It's great to be here with you all talking today about climate change and its impact on us all with views from experts, from academics, and also from our university student populations. I'm always delighted when we, uh, when we get the students engaged in the work of the network, something I think this network does very admirably. I was really pleased to be asked to uh, chair this session by my uh, friends at the University of Alia, and I'm delighted to welcome Professor Abdullah al Haj and Professor Mansour Ali to join me this afternoon, this morning, wherever in the world you are. My role at the World Technology Universities Network was the operational board chair, which I handed over just in the last few months to another colleague. Uh, I've been delighted to play such an active role in this network, which I think is a, a really strong group of people. And it is great to see so many of you here with us today. Uh, Professor Abdullah, would you like to say something about the session, please? Hello, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you, Professor okay. Abdullah. Yeah, I would like to, of course, uh, welcome every one of you. And I hope you are okay, Joe, because your voice a bit... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'm really very pleased to start hosting this very, very important topic by Ahliya University. And I take this opportunity to thank you, Joe, for being the chair of the board for, for uh, I think, two years. And uh, thank you for Sonia, of course, who is behind uh, this great events, you know. Uh, and it's my pleasure to, to that Ahliya University is a part uh, of the, this uh, network. Uh, since uh, the beginning, and uh, we believe really in collaboration between these universities and uh, unfortunately in the last probably two years we've been online, but thank God for technology, we could see every one of you, uh, and we can say very clearly good morning, good afternoon, and a probably good evening for some people in the uh, other side of the hemisphere. So Ahliya uh, University in Bahrain, you know, uh, is very proud that our students really are going to give you this uh, presentation uh, about a very, very important topic, climate change. And, you know, uh, we must work together in the whole world for uh, this very important topic. For this reason, really, uh, Ahliya University uh, is a part of the network, a very, very active part. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank every one of you. And I could see some of my colleagues here, Professor Amin Rubian, and, uh, 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 and from Bahrain, Dr. Afayel Khalifa. I welcome her, and of course, you know, um, uh, yani, thanks for our students who are going to really give us this. It will be my pleasure listening to them, and I wish you all the success. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Sonia. And uh, we must say to our so Bradford University, thank you very much for hosting also uh, this very, very important event. We started there, and we are still uh, all the time with the Bradford. Yesterday I've seen a great session really, and today inshallah we'll see another very successful session. Thank you very much. You know, I don't want to take more of your time. I'm very eager to listen mm. mainly to the students, you know. Thank you indeed, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Abdullah. I understand uh, Professor Mansour, uh, has also joined us from Alia, 
Um, Professor Mansour, would you like to just Unfortunately, say... it looks like he is in Dubai and he is uh, going to be in the airplane soon. So I don't know if he will, if he can... I'm here, anything. I'm here. Oh, I'm you're here. here. Oh, here. good, good. He's there, he's there. You're with us. Okay. That's that's very good. Would you like to say a couple of words, uh, okay. Mansour? Okay. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you, Joe. Uh, you know, I'm speaking to you from the lounge in Dubai airport on the way back to Bahrain. Uh, this year really uh, is a, a special privilege for Ali University because we have to, the opportunity to conduct a three hour session, which is a combination of uh, a debate, keynote speakers and a, a short film. This is our contribution to uh, climate change and you know, the impact on the world. We, it was a short time. We uh, tried to do our best and hopefully all will like it. You know, I'm, I'm also you know, very pleased to notice that WTUN is expanding and is grouping more universities and more people. And I think it's clearly it's on the way uh, to progress. Uh, we would like, I want to use this opportunity to say that all these partner universities, we would like to be more positively involved with them and to have practical links and practical cooperation between us and them. You know, I wish you all the best of luck and uh, Ahliya would, is, will, will be an active member in WTUN. We are happy to be members and we want to be more involved and more active. As you can see, my mask is in my pocket. I'm sat in the lounge, but I, I still want to welcome you and wish you the best and I will be with you all the way until I go on the airplane. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank you, Mansour, and thank you for your dedication joining us in uh, in the lounge at the airport. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear of a friend and colleague who is uh, who is traveling internationally. It's uh, it's really wonderful. Fingers thank crossed, you. fingers crossed, we'll all be we'll all be meeting face to face more again soon. Thank you, I'm delighted to welcome um, Dr. Tasnim Atatreya, who is the World Health Organization's representative to the Kingdom of Bahrain, to talk to us on this topic of climate change. Um, a lot of her work is in public health. She's a public health specialist, medical doctor and policy fellow, and has been working on interventions in this sphere for the last 20 years looking at how the SDGs can impact and how national health strategies can work with that. I'm going to really enjoy this talk. I'm looking forward to hearing from her. Dr. Tasnim, may I hand over to you? Thank you very much. Please first allow me to start uh, with thanking you all for giving me the opportunity to speak at this important forum. Special thanks uh, to His Excellency Dr. Abdullah Hawaj and to Ahliya University uh, for uh, extending this invitation to the WHO uh, country office in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Um, I'm really excited uh, not only to talk about this important topic, but also to bring highlights from a report that was recently published by the World Health Organization bringing this topic not only to the light uh, because of its important importance, but also to link it to the COVID pan pandemic. So I just prepared a few slides uh, that I would like uh, to share um, and to guide me in, in this uh, brief uh, interaction uh, with all distinguished colleagues and students who are uh, our future and uh, our future leaders and scientists. Um, so climate change is one of the greatest global health threats of uh, this century, especially that it affects number of social and environmental determinants of health. It is estimated that bet it between 2030, 2050, the climate change is expected to cause approximately a quarter of a million additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and uh, other conditions, including the heat, the heat stress. 
the direct damage caused uh, to health, uh, which is basically um, um, is that is in addition to morbidity and mortality, is also estimated between two to four billion dollars per year by 2030. Um, accordingly, addressing climate change would be also the greatest opportunity to advance health and public health globally. When we are focusing on the impact of climate change, it causes number uh, of uh, challenges, not only to health, but also to our environment and access to an environment where we can um, ensure health and well-being. Especially, it affects access to safe water. It affects access to uh, safe air and the air quality. Moreover, it affects access to food security and food safety. And moreover, it affects um, uh, the, the issues that are relevant to vector-borne diseases. To take this further and to talk about the direct impact of climate change on health, it causes deaths and injuries. It causes destruction to shelter, uh, damages to food, uh, damages to crops, and accordingly, food shortages. It can cause uh, re-emerging infectious diseases, uh, and moreover, it can uh, cause a huge destruction to health services and damage to the health system. And of course, it can impact the mental health. And in our region, in the Eastern Mediterranean region, we have uh, examples where uh, in, in countries that it affected highly, um, not only causing morbidity and mortality, but moreover, jeopardizing a lot of what has been um, um, or invested to establish an infrastructure. To take this further, when it comes talking about how it impacts um, foodborne uh, diseases and can impact, have an impact on malnutrition and connecting this to climate change, uh, we are here talking about how uh, this can um, affect access to water, where cities can run dry, insufficient water uh, for hygiene and health protection, would cause uh, waterborne diseases, foodborne diseases, and malnutrition, equally compromised water quality and reduced food production, which can also um, highly contribute to food insecurity. When it comes to many vector diseases such as malaria, dengue fever, they are also climate sensitive. So malaria transmission is sensitive to temperature changes where in countries where they have already succeeded uh, in, in compacting it, there is uh, a potential increase of pre-emerging. In other countries, there is a potential increase of uh, new cases and moreover an increase of transmission in existing areas. Um, similarly, it has an additional challenge to health system where uh, reverse, it can reverse a lot of gains in the fight against the disease and all the great efforts that have been made by countries uh, to, um, to control diseases uh, would also be jeopardized. To take um, um, the issue further, I want to share with you uh, the highlights of uh, the WHO special report on climate change and health, which was launched uh, on October 11th. And here, please allow me to share a quote from my Director General, Dr. Tedros, where he highlighted that COVID-19 pandemic has shown a light on the delicate link between, um, between uh, when it comes between humans, animals, and our environment. Moreover, countries must set an ambitious national climate commitment if they are to sustain a healthy and green recovery from COVID-19. The report is just published uh, before uh, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, which is planned uh, later uh, in November in Scotland. And it spells out the global health community prescription for climate action based on a growing body of research that establishes the many and uh, 
uh, the links uh, between climate and health. And uh, to summarize the main 10 recommendations out of this report, it focuses on a commitment to healthy recovery, where it basically promotes um, uh, a more of a healthy and green environment. It promotes uh, the fact that we all agree about that our health is not negotiable. Moreover, it focuses on the importance of the health benefits when we are linking it with climate action, where we can't achieve a full status of health and well-being without taking into consideration the climate and the environment. It also built health resilience to climate risks, which also enforces and promotes building climate resilience environment uh, that is basically environmentally sustainable uh, with taking into consideration the importance of research, the importance of having a framework of policy and governance. It also recommends the importance of creating energy system that protect and improve climate and health. The more um, the recommendations also have been extended to promoting sustainable, healthy and herbal designs of transport systems um, and promoting it even uh, for, uh, to, to increase access to the different uh, facilities at the community level. It also promotes the healthy lifestyles and ensuring a sustainable food system and livelihoods. And it promotes uh, a sustainable and resilient food production and more affordable nutrition, nutritionist diet that deliver on both climate and health outcomes. Last but not least, the main recommendation is the importance to listen to the community and the importance of mobilizing and support health, uh, um, to support the health of the community on climate action. Please allow me to summarize key action points. If we are to address the issue of climate change, we need to focus on main actions. We need to focus on raising the awareness and advocating for the protection of health, protection of health from climate changes. We need to uh, support assessments uh, that can give us information for action and can give the policymakers more evidence on the health, on the link between health and climate change. And moreover, that can basically give us more idea on the cost and do more investment in climate change to improve health. We need to work more on developing early warning systems and adaptations that mitigate the actions uh, and that can uh, protect health uh, from climate change. And also we need to support health promotion in a way that it's climate sensitive and ensure that we are engaging policymakers and leaders to participate and to make this process possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tasneem. I found that very interesting. Um, one of the things that's always occurred to me in relation to climate change and the sustainable development goals is those interdependencies between the sustainable development goals. And I think those 10 recommendations really highlighted that you'd got things around transport as well as, as you know, into health. It, it's quite fascinating. Um, I thought they were very broad recommendations and uh, quite interesting. I was very pleased to see on one of your early slides that you'd mentioned mental health as well. Uh, I think one of the one of the positives that's come out of COVID is much more awareness and understanding of that as an important factor. So thank you very much. I'm going to hold on some of the questions that have been popped in and we'll do the questions uh, together with questions for our next keynote speaker, who is Dr. Simon Mayer from the University of Bradford. Um, 
Simon is a lecturer in circular economy and data analytics and is involved in a couple of very interesting projects, one of which is actually around marine spatial planning addressing climate effects where he leads a work package on input-output models to explore the links between marine resources, climate change and regional supply chains. So this is going to be a, an interesting different view, I think, but we'll probably showcase more of that intersectionality. Simon, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Oh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I wanted to, in this talk, address the title of the session directly and ask what does it mean to say that climate and climate change affects all so we all live within a climate system and the figure you can see here uh, shows the different parts of that system so we have the atmosphere which is the air that we breathe we have the hydrosphere which are the rivers that we swim in and the lakes that we gaze over we have the biosphere which is the forests that we walk through and the fields that we grow food in and it's the interactions between all of these things which makes the climate system. You can also see on this diagram the human influence because we're all part of a climate system. We live within it, we affect it and it affects us. And as such, we all have a deep connection to the climate. As the geologist Tony Eggleton writes, weather is what happened today or yesterday or this year or since the baby was born. Climate is what you understand about a place when you've lived in it for 30 years or longer. So climate change does affect us all because when the climate changes our homes change and as our homes change our lives change. For example climate change affects our work. As the planet gets hotter work becomes more difficult and this leads to things like lower productivity. People have to slow down and they have to work less. So this is what we can see on the figure on the screen now, uh, which shows basically how productive uh, female brick workers in India are as temperatures rise. Uh, what you're seeing is essentially workers have, having to work more slowly in order to protect themselves. And this is because work, especially manual work, is more dangerous than extremes of heat. And extreme heat is already linked to major health risks for agricultural workers, for instance, and this is projected to get worse with climate change. But we can also think about this in a much bigger context. So what this figure is showing you is the Earth's temperature over a 60 million year period. And you can see that like the Earth's temperature has varied massively in this time. But what I want you to focus on is the small area which starts about 12,000 years ago, which is marked on this figure with the term agriculture and civilization. Uh, this period is a period of unusually stable climate. It's known as the Holocene pause. And it's in this period that we developed agriculture and civilization. So put simply, our economies and our societies have all developed in this unusually stable period of climate. And we don't really know what our home looks like, what our economies look like in a changed planet. So yes, climate change does affect us all. We all face a common challenge. You might be a student or you might be an academic. You might live in Bahrain or in the United Kingdom, but we all have a common interest. Uh, we can and we should work together to uh, further that common interest. We should work together to do something to stop climate change. But although climate does affect us all, it does not affect us all equally. Our ability to respond to climate change uh, and how badly the climate will affect us is largely a result of the power that we have. Climate change is the result of capitalism, and capitalism is a system of economic production that relies on the exploitation of labor and the environment in order to produce profits. It is a system that is built on class, gender, and racial exploitation. And capitalism is a context in which climate change happens. So the people with the most power under capitalism, predominantly wealthy, white, heterosexual men in the, in the global north, stand to lose the least, and perhaps even to gain from climate change. So the figure that you can see here is a projected distribution of economic damage due to climate change. And what I want you to notice on this is that the damage is not evenly distributed. What we see is that countries in the global south are likely to suffer proportionally much more than countries in the global north. But 
Likewise, this figure is showing more projected mortality impacts from climate change. And again, I want you to notice this global distribution. Um, again, the global south suffers proportionally much more than the global north. And there are a couple of points to raise here. The first is that the global south is historically less responsible for climate change, even though it will feel the effects worse, because it's emitted less carbon. But I also want to point out this distribution reflects the power dynamics inherent in the global capitalist economy. The North is wealthier, and it built this wealth through exploitation of the South. So to explore the dynamics of climate and capitalism, let's take a step back and look a bit more at the roots of climate change. So what you can see on this figure is the link between energy use and GDP per capita. So essentially GDP per capita is a measure of the productive capacity of the capitalist economy. And look how tightly linked these things are. As GDP goes up, so does primary energy use. And this actually should not particularly be surprising. All economic production requires energy. So if you're going to grow your production, grow your productive capacity, you're more than likely going to grow your energy use. This figure breaks down the energy use from a previous graph by type. And what you can see here is that the vast majority of the energy used since 1900 and previously, but it's not on this graph, is fossil fuels. One of the major drivers of climate change, we burn fossil fuels, release carbon to the atmosphere. And it's this use of fossil fuels in production, which has fueled growth in the capitalist economy. Indeed, the history of capitalism is bound up in the use of fossil fuels to expand production and to exploit workers. Economic historians point to the transition from the use of wood and water powered economies to one which is powered by coal and fossil fuels as being intimately linked to the story of the development of capitalist economies. And we can look a bit further back in time, looking at England specifically. So what you can see here is coal use in England from about 1500 to the late 1800s. And the line here, which represents, again, growth in the economy. And what you're seeing is that as the capitalist economy takes off, England transitions into a capitalist phase. You see massive GDP growth, but also that growth being fueled by the use of coal. The transition to fossil fuels basically boosted that growth, boosted profits in two ways. So first, it allows more energy to be brought into production. Things like coal and other fossil fuels are incredibly energy dense. So what that means is that a worker using coal can typically produce more stuff more cheaply than a worker using wood. Uh, use of, but use of fossil fuels also allowed kind of a change in organi organizational structure. So it allowed the formation of centralized factories and the bringing in of previously distributed workforces to one central location where they could be worked harder and monitored more effectively by their employers. Now, the social and economic pressures which led to widespread fossil fuel use in production uh, were basically the same ones that led to the development of capitalist economies. Um, so a figure on this slide shows Chinese and European economic development from the kind of 1300s again up to the mid 1800s. Basically, until about 1700, China and Europe had comparable economies in terms of their size and their complexity. Uh, we also know that they had relatively similar levels of coal use, primarily in a domestic context. But Europe had a different institutional setting, which pushed it to grow productivity um, from in a kind of proto-capitalist, pre-capitalist way. And it's this desire to drive productivity, to produce more things and produce them more cheaply, which led to the adoption of fossil fuels and the development of capitalist economies. By contrast, uh, pre-capitalist China had a very different social context for its use of coal. And so as the historians De Beer et al. write, coal did not create new social needs in China. It did not constantly push the borders of its own market outwards. Proto-industrialization and economic growth were remarkable achievements, but they failed to generate an accelerated division of labor. It's also worth pointing out at this stage that coal use and then further fossil fuel use in Britain was promoted by the state. And primarily it did this as a way to develop and protect its military power. And this is the same military power that would then be used to develop its colonies and its empire. The obsession with productivity, which drove widespread adoption of fossil, uh, fossil fuels in order to grow uh, capitalist production is also linked to the oppression of women. The historian Silvia Federici shows how the development of capitalism required the creation of a gendered division of labor, the creation of the idea of men's work and women's work. So-called men's work, 
was called productive because it produced profits. And women were forcibly kept away from this work by violent coercion and by legal procedure. Federici argues that this gendered division of labor served to divide those who were losing out in the transition to capitalism. Men and women both lost access to land, for example, but only men gained access to the marketplace. And Federici argues that in this way, the possibility for a class solidarity and a broad-based opposition to change was undermined. Now, these issues are not only historical. Today, feminist scholars point to the fact that a small number of predominantly wealthy, white, heterosexual men in the global north continue to wield extraordinary power over the future of our climate. And they continue to prioritize the production of profits over protection of life and livelihoods. Indigenous communities fight to keep land and livelihood from being destroyed. In May 2020, uh, the mining company Rio Tinto destroyed the Duke and Gorge rock shelters, an area which represented 46,000 years of culture for the Putu country. Kurami and Pinakuru people. As Sakshi shows, this is a result of the failings of settler colonial legal frameworks in Australia, which don't require consultation with indigenous groups, and also the way that extractive capitalism prioritizes growth and innovation over a much broader set of values. Global energy companies have trillions of dollars worth of fossil fuels that cannot be burnt if we're going to stay within two degrees of global warming. Whether these are privately owned companies or state owned companies, they will fight against action on global warming because their profits and perhaps even their existence depends on the continued use of fossil fuels and capitalist production. So let us now revisit our climate system diagram. And at this point, I want to ask and draw your attention to again to the idea that human influences are at the center of this. Are these really human influences or is it specific groups of people who really has influence and decision making power here? Because climate does affect us all, but it does not affect us all equally. For most of us, climate change will be an unmitigated disaster. We will lose loved ones to heat waves. We will see species die and our homes wither and change. But for some, climate will continue to be a moneymaker. The rest of us, the majority of the world, must come together around our common interest. We must challenge those who would threaten our home in the pursuit of our own profits and power. This will not be easy. It will be difficult on a personal level. For those of us in the global north and those of us who are wealthy, it will mean reconciling with the fact that our lifestyles must change. We cannot live as we do. Our lifestyles are built on the exploitation of labor and resources of the global south. For those of us who are men, we must recognize that masculine ideas and masculine ideals have been and continue to be part of the problem. We need humility and willingness to accept the ways that some of us benefit from the systems that create climate change. Once we accept this, we can come together to support and work both with those who suffer most from capitalism and climate change. It will also be difficult on a structural level. Those who stand to win from climate change are unlikely to give the rest of us a seat at the decision-making table. But remember that we are many, and together we are powerful. We must lobby and protest, get our governments to listen to us and to protect our home. We must work together, form groups across professions and genders and nations to challenge the inequalities of the capitalist system. We must work together to claim our seat at the decision-making table. So what does it mean to say that climate affects all? It means that many of us risk seeing our home change, irreversibly and for the worse. It means that some people stand to make a large amount of money and power from our loss. It means that the way we experience the effects of climate change is mediated by the by a capitalist system that creates climate change. And this insight has to be the central principle around which our action on climate change is organized. Once we understand that some of us will win and some of us will lose because we have different levels of power and decision-making ability under capitalism, then we can come together to do something about that. We can organize our struggle so that it takes aim at the systemic inequities that create climate change in the first place. Together, we must engage politically. Join a union, join a political party, do things that further our common interests in, joy in saving our home. And understand that for most of us, my struggle is your struggle. But that struggle involves taking on people and systems of power. Together, we can work to push for changes within and beyond capitalism. Together, we can organize for a system that puts life and livelihood before profits. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, uh, Simon, Dr. Simon. That was uh, that was um, a very, very uh, inspiring, inspiring talk. Um, 
as a as a woman, I often kind of uh, end up feeling quite a rise in anger whenever we get the gender debate going. But uh, I will attempt to be constructive, and uh, as indeed I think you were during your um, your talk. So we've got a couple of questions that have come in on the chat for our speakers. If anybody else would like to ask any questions, please either put them in the chat or use the reactions button to raise your hand and I'll go around anybody that actually has any questions. Uh, I'm going to take chair's privilege, so I'm going to have to ask my colleague Mike to wait a minute, uh, because I wondered if I could ask uh, Dr Tasneem uh, one of the things you talked about was transitioning towards a well-being economy. And I wondered if the World Health Organization uh, or yourself had ideas of where there is best practice of this idea of a well-being economy, because it sounds like such an aspiration. How do we get there? Who can we learn from on that particular question? To answer your question, uh, I want to uh, give an example of the proposed World Health Organization framework uh, to advance uh, the realization of health through addressing climate change. This framework uh, is basically structured on four main principles. First is to promote governance, uh, policy and engagement for health protection from climate change. Second, it, it promotes climate resilient health system through having a robust uh, surveillance and early warnings uh, and response for climate sensitive health impact. The third, through enhancing the management of environmental health interventions, services and determinants. And last but not least, to mobilize the support for public health response for climate change. So if we addressed our impact, each element of this framework, we would need to identify tailored interventions at country level where we can tackle and where we can identify priority interventions that are effective and efficient to clear. We, through the WHO platform, in addition to providing the tools um, and uh, the, the guidance to the processes to take this forward, we call for the importance of multi-sectoral action. No one can do it alone. And addressing health and climate change doesn't only lie under the responsibility of health authorities. It is the responsibility of the whole government so to, to address your question, I would end with the importance of calling for a whole of government and a whole of a community response to address uh, climate change and health. Thank you, uh, Tasnim. And doesn't that just link so closely to um, what Simon was saying about the need to come together in order to address these issues? Uh, just before I go to uh, Michael, I'm going to see if Tal Talshiwari Tal Shiwari has put a couple of questions in the chat. Would you like to ask them or shall I just read them from the chat? Just trying to yes, please go ahead, you can read them. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for asking them. So in the chat we have, uh, um, thanks for the session, and two questions. First question is, is the measure of climate action indicators uniform on national levels in all uh, countries? And uh, the second one, which uh, builds on Simon's talk probably, would it be possible, is it possible to leave climate actions to the politicians without impeding it in all education curriculum from the inception of formal education? So I think that's about Politics, education, where do we where do we start with climate action? And do you have any information, either of our speakers, on uh, national levels for uh, measures of climate action indicators? Um, Simon, can I go to you first? Uh, yeah, sure. On in terms of climate action indicators on a national level, I mean I know there's the sustainable development goals. 
have their indicators, which are being applied in various ways. You kind of very quickly get into politics around that, though. So the UK government has, for example, been quite quite selective in which indicators it chooses to look at. And even the creation of those indicators is quite political. So the inequality indicator tends to look more at raising at the bottom rather than focusing on the top end of that income distribution. Um, would it be possible to leave climate actions to politicians? I mean, I don't see any other way to push climate action without being in that kind of political sphere. I'm not sure it's a case of leaving it to politicians so much as pushing politicians to take those actions, which is perhaps where education comes in to raise awareness. Thank you, Simon. Tasneema, do you have anything you'd like to add? I do believe that a meeting, uh, the meeting we have today is a strong statement uh, about the importance role uh, of the education sector. And I think um, what we have here today uh, in this platform is, um, is showing the commitment of the distinguished uh, participant from the academic institution, not only about the importance of the role of engaging education, but also of the role of, edu of the education and the academic institutions to provide the evidence base because to, to promote information for action tailored to any country, we need the cooperation of the academic institutions because they have uh, the resources required. And here I do mean with the resources, the brains, uh, and they have also um, the, the positive energy coming and the voices of the community coming from the students where they are also bringing the knowledge forward. And they are the advocate really for change. So when we are engaging students in research or in our on, on, on awareness, we are also providing the leaders of tomorrow who can sustain and make the change. So the university can contribute in different ways by providing the evidence base, by raising awareness, by engaging policymakers, and by producing. Uh, the sustainable change uh, uh, with the educated, empowered students. Thank you, Tasneem, and I, I, I'm not sure how long you can stay with us today, but that uh, that student panel later on could be could be quite interesting with those thoughts. Um, Tal Shiwari, thank you very much for those questions. Hopefully, the thoughts from our speakers have responded to those. Uh, can I go to Professor Michael Fitzpatrick, who's one of our general board members at the World Technology Universities Network, and invite Mike to ask his question. Um, yes, thank, thank you, Joe. Thanks to the speakers. I think that was great. Um, I think, uh, so I, I'd like to make a couple of, uh, well, one comment and one half question. And, and the comment is really, um, one of the things that we need to do is we need to start moving the discussion away from what's being called net zero, because net zero um, uh, allows for effectively a continuation of business as usual for the people who, who want it. Um, because, you know, you, 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 you keep on burning the fossil fuels, you keep on generating um, sort of the carbon dioxide, but then, you know, so somebody somewhere um, promises that they've taken some mitigating actions and, and, and an industry is building up around this, which is having zero effect. There is a scheme in America that does um, uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, where does it get the carbon dioxide from? Uh, it mines it from an underground reservoir 300 kilometers away. So it moves carbon dioxide from one location to another location and, uh, and, and then sells credits to allow people to burn fossil fuels. The, 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 the net benefit is, is negative to, to the global climate. So we need to be moving to actual zero. We need to be stopping the generation of carbon emissions in the first place. So the, 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 the net zero agenda, I think historically will be viewed as, uh, well, I mean, the, 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 the term that's becoming common is greenwashing. So we need to be evolving the debate towards that. But um, I went to a talk um, a, a few months ago and somebody came with an interesting perspective and they said, if we start to think of climate change as a health and safety problem rather than a political problem, and, and you make it a problem for regulators, yeah, 
then regulators get things done. Regulators, you know, can say you may not um, uh, have carbon emissions, you may not um, have um, domestic fossil fuel use, and, uh, and 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 that then begins to, to to really make a difference because you have the action end of things. Because can politicians do things? Well, you know, we could debate that for the rest of the afternoon and not have an answer. But once, um, yeah, what regulators are very good at saying, you know. Um, in, in terms of, uh, of what has a negative effect on workers and on the population, we understand that um, and, and we can start to put restrictions in place. So uh, how we do it, I don't know, but just having that thought of, you know, this is a global health and safety problem, not a political problem, um, but it's, it's, it's something where if we not, do not take action, there will be deaths, is, is the useful reframing of the, of the discussion. So whether you have any comments on, on either of those. Um, Tasneem, would you would you like to comment? That sounds very supportive of the the framework that you talked about. Yes, I can see a big grin. That was presumably music to your ears. But one of one thing I've thought is I understand how regulators work here in the UK. But do other countries have have regulators who have economic sticks that they can pressure industry with? Um, is it something that could make a difference, Dr. Tasneem? Um, to say the truth, um, I learned something during COVID. Um, due to the uh, to the stress, uh, either uh, from uh, the physical distancing or the travel restrictions, and then the huge demands where I felt like I need to do more and more, I started every day with asking me with asking myself a question: What I can change today? that is under my control. And there I should start. And I use the same motto when I'm working with my partners, my colleagues, and in countries where uh, I am bringing uh, the technical and the strategic advice. So to make uh, this more operational, I do believe that we need to start on the areas where we can make the difference and make these actions progressive uh, in a sorry in a progressive approach because what is accepted today would not be no longer accepted tomorrow um, and i do believe there is an importance of having an action plan where this action plan uh, to make governments and countries accountable we also need to ensure that this action plan are based on priorities countries can't address everything from a to z overnight so a prioritization exercise should be taking uh, place, assessment should be taking place, mapping should be taking place, all of this before we have, we bring stakeholders together around the table and make a multi-sectoral action, bringing all the key players, making them accountable for measurable activities. Um, and I do believe that this would not be complete because policies and regulations is one part of the story. We need also to ensure at, at the service delivery level, do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the tools? Do we have the trained um, uh, practitioners to promote this? And I'm here when I'm talking about the trained people, I, I, I do believe that, um, again, just to bring the importance of uh, the academic institutions to to bring these uh, uh, to bring this knowledge up to speed. In addition to the role of WHO, the UN system, and other agencies, but I do believe that each one of us have have a role. And last but not least, in looking into these action plans to make them operational, we need to ensure that they are budgeted. And here also comes the importance because you can have the policy, you can have the regulation, you can have the commitment but maybe you would not have the enough resources to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So it's, there is also the importance, and this is why when I'm saying multi-sectoral and a whole of government approach, this would also ensure the commitment, mobilization of resources and the accountability to the community at national and global level to make it possible. Last but not least, climate change and the impact of the climate change is something that doesn't require a visa or a passport to affect one country and not affect the another. 
Um, so that's why it's important that we all take actions, uh, work in solidarity and work together to make these actions uh, sustainable. So we need also, when we are thinking about helping countries in developing national action plan, we need also to think about how we can work across borders mm -hmm. uh, and working with all of our neighbors at a regional and global level to make it possible. Thank you. Thank you, Tasneem. We are out of time, but I'm aware, Simon, you might want to make a, a last comment. Is there something brief you would like to just add, perhaps in response to uh, Professor Fitzpatrick's point? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, just briefly, uh, I see the appeal of framing climate change as a health and safety and regulatory issue, but I, I worry about that framing backgrounding with politics, because I would see regulation and health and safety as political anyway, put in place by political um, kind of actions. And also the efficacy of regulation depends on political support, both in terms of a general support from the government, but actually specifically around financing and what, what that regulation has the power to do. So I, I, I would just be a little wary about kind of removing that kind of political framing. Mm. The politics comes, it comes back to the politics so frequently, doesn't it? Okay, thank you both so much for your time today, for your thought provoking presentations. We very much appreciate you joining us. And uh, I, I look forward to, uh, to finding out more about some of the points you've raised uh, uh, later on. Uh, thank you again to the audience for the questions we've had. Um, we've now got a film uh, to be shared by Alia University on climate action. So there's going to be a little video interlude. Earth the third planet from the sun, a world where most of the surface is covered in liquid water with hospitable temperatures, making it a unique world that can harbor life. Throughout its history, Earth's climate has gone through numerous natural changes most of which are attributed to small variations that change the amount of solar energy the planet receives. Today, the Earth's climate is still changing. However, the current trend is of particular significance. As the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has concluded that human activity has unequivocally resulted in the warming of the atmosphere at an unprecedented rate, causing widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere and biosphere. The Earth's average surface temperature has risen 1.18 degrees Celsius since the late 19th century, accompanying the rise of the modern industrial age. A change driven largely by increased carbon dioxide emissions, which is inherently destructive to the planet. From the homes we live in, roads we walk on, transportation we ride, gadgets we use, the use of fossil fuels, such as oil and coal to power up factories, has contributed to the release of a massive amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, in addition to a growing population that has tripled since the beginning of the last century. A rise in food consumption trends and modern food production practices release a copious amount of methane, a gas 23 times more effective in trapping heat than CO2 into the atmosphere, causing what is known as the greenhouse effect. Causing the planet to warm up, leading to warmer winters and harsher summers. And we are already getting a taste, with the last decade being recorded as the warmest in history. Droughts are already more frequent and severe, 
If humanity continues down the path it's treading at its current speed, the world will have to deal with extreme reoccurring natural events. With every year wasted, more extreme changes will be unavoidable. Thus, immediate change is a must. The question is, how? Fixing a small part of the current global industrial system is not enough, as many of the different parts need unique solutions, as humanity has come to rely heavily on certain technology perpetuating the emissions of greenhouse gases. Take the concrete industry for example. Although it provides a cheap and accessible way of building affordable housing and infrastructure for the masses, it is responsible for 8% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions, contributing more CO2 than aviation fuel, and not far behind the global agricultural business. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 13 focuses on taking urgent climate action to combat climate change through regulating emissions and promoting the development of renewable energy. Putting action at a national level in focus. But how can we, as individuals, make a difference? What it requires is a collective will and the determination to change. Reuse, reduce, recycle. There are a lot of simple actions that are easy to implement and are effective, especially if we all adopt them. From reusable, recyclable products to using power efficient LED light bulbs, turning off unused electronics, and reducing the amount of waste we produce, leading to less landfill emissions. Converting to renewable energy. Educating. And spreading awareness on climate change issues. Planting trees. And making small changes to our everyday diet. Are all small actions that can have a huge effect through aggregating across the collective. Climate change is happening and the time for action is now. Thank you very much, uh, friends from Alia, who have produced, uh, again, such, a, such an inspiring uh, and beautifully done video. Thank you for that. I'm pleased to move on to um, the next part of our programme, which is a panel discussion looking at our topic of climate change affecting all and we have a number of speakers um, from the UK, from India, um, from Bahrain. Uh, each speaker will uh, present their key points uh, taking five minutes to introduce uh, their topic and their remarks and then we will have a panel discussion for 20 minutes. After that there'll be a short interlude where we can also take questions from the audience so please do jot down those. You can either send those into uh, the chat, type them into the chat or uh, once we get to that point clearly raise your hand. Okay, so I'm very pleased to welcome our first speaker, uh, Major Mohammed Al Qasim from the Bahrain Coastal Guard, um, where he is head of the administration division. Uh, he holds a BSc in marine biology and a master's in business management and has a wealth of experience in the field of environmental protection and fisheries. Over to you, Major Mohammed. You have five minutes. Yes, thank you very much.
Yes, thank you very much for having me. I'll be talking about a specific area in uh, combating climate change, which is actually the environmental enforcement process. As we said before, it's uh, the policy and regulatory systems a different issue. There, there have some issues that we need to tackle in the implementation process. I'm going to talk about, hello, can you hear me? Is it okay? Or... Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Okay. So it's going to be crowdsourced technology as a collaborative tool for environmental enforcement. The aim of this presentation is to review the existing crowdsourced technologies in environmental enforcement and other relevant fields. Global governments and organizations have realized that their aspiration to achieve defining economic goals and development rates will always be hindered by the current unsustainable carbon emission levels. Despite the existence of massive systems of national and international laws, treaties, and agreements to curb the issue of climate change, these options seem not to cope with the degree and speed of challenges associated with climate change. Relative measures in environmental policy implementation are found to be an effective tool in dealing with the ineffective nature of current policy systems in environmental protection. Technologies such as crowdsource application are being increasingly utilized to help enhance and facilitate law enforcement all around the world. To increase community participation, crowdsource technologies are being implemented as a collaborative tool to incorporate the public in the environmental protection process, including environmental law enforcement. Three current ways in which uh, crowdsourcing was uh, applied in environmental protection were through environmental monitoring, awareness, and the research process. Very few studies have been done on the potential of crowdsourcing innovation in enforcement of environmental law. Two interesting examples of Crowdsource application and environmental monitoring and awareness are noise tube, which is a low cost approach to monitor noise pollution, which uses the public and mobile devices as noise sensors. This initiative is an effective tool in gathering data on noise pollution to support policy and decision making. It can also be used by citizens for a range of methods from increasing awareness to gathering evidence. Another one is the City Sense MOB project which are monitors that allow users to monitor air quality infrastructure to monitor environmental data continually using micro sensors fixed on moving platforms such as vehicles or even people. The project's final output will provide real-time data on air quality and CO2 emissions at road level for both authorities and citizens. The project is also expected to increase awareness on climate change and air pollution, as well as the awareness of health impacts of air pollution. In environmental research, availability and low cost of mobile and personal environmental monitoring innovations have been the main factors driving the increased interest in participatory research in environmental science. One example of this crowdsource tool is social media. Although social media has been an important source of data, on human nature interactions, analysis of social media is still limited and are not applied to their full potential. When it comes to criminal law enforcement, they were found to be in three main areas, legislative process, crime reporting and crime prevention, which includes in the investigation in some cases, and also collaboration of the public into the law enforcement systems. Technology has altered and modified the strategies applicable in environmental compliance and enforcement and impacted the process concerning accuracy and reduction of human to human interaction. Crowdsource technology have eased the collection, processing, and even the management of data during law enforcement. Creating a solution to various environmental problems using crowdsourcing as a participatory tool concept or tool instead of force avoid suspicious activity related to human investigation. The potential of participatory approaches, specifically through crowdsourced innovations to enhance environmental law enforcement, is available. 
although crowdsourcing has been used in several initiatives in the past for research, awareness, and monitoring, very few were directly used in the environmental enforcement process. Having said this, the decision makers and implementers must keep in mind some of the limitations of these technologies, such as data quality and volume, privacy, privacy issues, and even data authenticity. Thank you. I try to keep it as short as I can. To go. Might be a bit quick, so sorry for it. You were perfectly on time. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mohammed, that was very helpful. Um, I'm sorry, I got my program mixed up. Um, so I'd like to just flip it round now and go to Professor Amma Al Raubait. Um, my apologies. We should have uh, we should have had you first up, but hopefully we can go to you now on the impact of climate change on human sustainability in the region. Uh, the professor currently teaches economics at Harlia University. Over to you. Amma. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, discussion workshop. I think climate change, it is uh, uh, timely and it's extremely important. And that's why a uh, discussion like this will be of, let's say, interest to all of us. Now you're giving me a very short time and I'm going basically to give you a summary of what I have that is um, uh, going to focus mainly on our region and this part of the world, because we are probably uh, one of the region that is, will be most affected by climate change. There's no doubt. If you look at all the report and studies coming from international institution, national governments over the past, number of few decades, they all point out to the fact that one of the greatest perhaps challenges facing humanity in the 21st century is going to be climate change. So climate change has become a matter of concern to everybody, not necessarily to one group or one nation, but all countries in the world will be affected. Now climate change will have far reaching consequences. Uh, on our health, on our food security, migration, human settlement, the environment, society, and biodiversity. So every aspect of our human life will be affected by it. The climate change will not be limited to one country or one region. It's a global. And that's why any action will be taken in this area has to be a collective and global. Unfortunately, many of the developing countries may not necessarily be in a position to, let's say, be able to reduce the risk of climate change without the help of international organization or without the help of rich countries. That's why it's important that we need a collective kind of approach or a model for let's say, reducing the impact of climate change on. Climate change, of course, will reduce the ability or the capability of nation to achieve sustainable development goals. These goals are set by the United Nations 2015. Now, uh, currently, it's about uh, nine out of 10 peoples on Earth, they breathe uh, pollute air. And that can give you something about the human health and the impact of that on health. Now, by 2030, it is estimated that 100 million people will be pushed into poverty because of climate change. And this is basically due to some of the uh, issues discussed by Dr. Simon, including uh, shrinking productivity of harvest, loss of capacity to work because of uh, the heat, uh, more wars, and we can probably reflect on what's happening uh, about uh, the Nile between Egypt and Ethiopia. Then, of course, diseases will spread, and then uh, prices of all the food that will be produced will increase. Just imagine, by 2050, the world population is expected to reach to 10 billion people. Then we live in a world which is, or a planet, unsustainable. 
Now, sustainable development is about building bridges between the future and the present. And if the present is not unsustainable, that will have a damaging impact on the future generation. And here we are talking about sustainable development. And we are the living human today. We have to be concerned about the future generation. But unfortunately, we are doing so much damage to the planet today. There is a large number of questions about whether uh, the future generation will be in a position to survive because of our action today. Now, of course, we should not blame only the natural forces, but as they mentioned before, human activities are largely responsible for what's happening in this. Now, uh, climate change could lead to an increase in the sea level. And here in Bahrain, some estimates come to the conclusion that Bahrain probably may lose five to 10% of its land because of, let's say, rising of um, sea level. Now, there are two important areas that we are, or it's a matter of concern to us in this part of the world, and they are directly related and indirectly related to climate change. These are water resources and fossil fuel. Now, our future development and our survival and our future generation will be basically shaped by the availability by these two resources, and in particular, water resources. Of course, when you look at all the uh, report and research done in the area of water, they all come to the conclusion that MENA region, that Middle East and North Africa has the greatest water shortages among all regions in the world. You see, in this part of the world, we consume about 80% of water availability. This is compared only to 2% to let's say people in Latin America or in the Caribbean or Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is just to give you an idea about the stress water problem that we will be facing in the future. Now, MENA region is home to about 6% of the world population. But these 6%, they receive less than 1% of fresh water resources in the world. Now, over 60% of the population in, live in MENA region. They live within high service water stress. We simply mean that this is compared, let's say, to the global water stress of 35%. Now, almost 70% of our GDP in this part of the world is generated in an area with high water, basically stress, compared to 22% in the rest of the world. The region is expected to have a loss of GDP between six to 14% by 2050. This is the estimate that will be due to water shortages. The major impact of availability of fresh water access, it is basically the quality. Now, um, 18 out of the 22 Arab countries are suffering from severe water shortages and seven, out of the 10 countries in the world that expected to suffer from water shortages and because of climate change are in the MENA region. Now, uh, the Arab countries, they import almost 35% of their food supply. And it's expected that by 2030, they will import 55% of their cereal meat. Now, of course, agriculture consume 80%. And unfortunately, most of the method in agriculture today is still the traditional method. So that's why one of the solution is that this part of the world, they need to have a, a scientific agriculture base in order to reduce the use of water in these countries. Professor Amai, could I ask yeah. you to do just wrap up your remarks in the next minute or two, please? Yeah, okay. I mean, um, okay, let, let me just say about the action and what is needed to be done in order to be able to at least mitigate and manage resources. There are a whole set 
of um, you know action or policies can be proposed some of it we heard from uh, uh, dr sam simon and others but generally speaking if we want to let's say reduce the risk of the impact of climate change then we need to have a clean energy system there's tremendous amount of research being done in the area of renewable energy now we are talking about the uh, fourth industrial revolution and the smart technologies and i think this is another dimension that is needed to be basically employed in order to have let's say control over the energy or the water or the now uh, we need to have a knowledge and uh, base um, in order to meet to be able to meet the climate now I think it is important from an economic point of view that we need to integrate the environmental climate change into the national policies and planning of all these countries. And when we speak about economic growth, being in the field of economics, we really need to think in terms of inclusive economic growth because climate change will affect everybody. And you cannot exclude anybody when it comes basically to climate change. Education and universities are critical. We need to have a national education system that will help basically increase awareness in the community. Then we need to uh, somehow uh, become efficient when we use resources and they need to change the development model that we have in this part of the world. It is still based on all traditional kind of let's say way of doing business or producing good and service then one uh, maybe 30 seconds you can give me now uh, uh, interestingly enough dr sami uh, uh, simon talked about capitalism but i think the emphasis should be about colonialism colonialism was largely responsible by forcing millions of let's say farmers to go into plantation and that is basically part of the problem that we have in many of the developing countries. And interestingly enough, there was a remark by Vladimir Putin of Russia that global warming could be good for Russia because it will extend their agriculture production to the north and will reduce the demand for farm. And that will help, of course, those who are in the enemy. Thank you very much. I have a, a lot to say, but uh, I will stop. Thank you, Professor Amir. Maybe you can bring some of those extra comments you've got into the discussion later on. Um, very interesting to finish with a quote from Vladimir Putin. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move on now quite neatly, actually, to Professor Preeti from uh, Hindustan Institute of Science and Technology, who is going to actually talk to us about climate change and the impact on agriculture. So I think that should uh, segue very nicely. Um, Professor Preeti, are you with us? I had a note to say um, that she had arrived. Yep, I can see you there. Can you hear me? Hi. Can we spotlight uh, Professor Preeti, please? Sonia? Can you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, can you able to see the slide? We can see you, Professor Preeti. We can't see your okay, slides yet. Yeah. Yes, now I'll share. Uh, we are ah, fabulous. So if you could keep your remarks to five, seven minutes, something like that, Preeti, that would be fantastic. Um, hopefully your slides are loading.
We can't see your slides yet. Yeah, a few minutes uh, I'll sharing now. Sorry for the delay. I'm sharing now in a few minutes. Professor Preethi, does um, the, the Secretariat have your slides? Yes, um, yes, if, yes. if so, they might be able to share. Okay, that's wonderful. Fantastic. So you've got about five minutes, five or six minutes, please. Yeah, sure. So good evening, one and all present here. And my topic is climate change effect uh, over agriculture. So, uh, one minute, I'll try to move the slide. It is not moving. I don't know why. Yeah, so how climate change affects agriculture? So this is a good question that increase in carbon dioxide directly increases the temperature of our globe. And because of this increase in absorbance of radio, that um, radiations emitted by solar and it is increasing the temperature of the globe and as well as it increases the, it raises the sea level and automatically it causes several impacts, uh, effects like temperature increasing or changing the temperature, precipitation changes, and also pest uh, pressures and pollination changes, both are biotic and uh, biobiotic. Uh, effects and uh, this but these effects all these effects directly has the effect in agriculture so in, in in it when it increases the carbon dioxide the c3 type of plant it absorbs the carbon dioxide directly and helps in growth good growth of the plant and it increases the productivity whereas in case of uh, increasing temperature it has a negative impact in growth of plants and also so uh, in, while increasing the flood level, automatically it causes flood and sometimes drought. And because of the change in precipitation, this kind of effects directly affects the production rate. And here we can be able to see the greenhouse gas emission, which increased the, significantly in last two decades. And also we can see here the quantity of emission of various greenhouse gases. And especially we can see carbon dioxide plays a main role among the other greenhouse gases and tremendously increases the temperature of our globe. And this well, mainly for agriculture, it also, uh, in case of agriculture, we can see only 30%, but however, in, in coming, upcoming 50 years, next 50 years, it is expected to uh, become more uh, uh, similar, equal to biomass burning, and uh, that may increase up to 60 to 70% when compared to uh, Greek, when compared to biomass and other effects, agriculture also tend to increase in next 50 years. And here we can see the various countries and it's uh, uh, the way how the person, the emission of carbon dioxide per person and India is playing a, a very least part and uh, but also the population because of high population, we may expect a um, maximum in future. And uh, there are uh, relationships, three relationships with uh, agriculture and climate change. The agriculture as a contributor to uh, climate change, number one. Number two, the positive impacts of uh, climate change over agriculture. And the third one, the negative impacts over agriculture, the climate change uh, because of the agriculture and uh, emission of uh, carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide as a contributor to climate change, we can see the uh, 30 to 30% of the, the carbon dioxide emission is coming from the anthropogenic activities like particulate matter emission and greenhouse gas emissions from biomass burning. 
and also we can see the um, the methane production and nitrous oxide production from livestock and also from agricultural activities and the negative effects of climate change on agriculture it, it affects it depends on the uh, type of crops and in case of wheat if we take it is sensitive to the topography the topospheric uh, the meat and sorry ozone because this ozone uh, because of the uh, the photo uh, photoactive process the photo the volatile organic compounds along with the um, methane it reacts with to form the ozone and this ozone is very reactive in nature and it reduces the productivity along with the carbon dioxide and the wheat crop productivity and the quantity the quantity of the production is also tend to reducing in, in and also it uh, the particular the temperature if it increases that crop uh, production also reduces in case of rice when the photosynthesis is um, a, in, if it is in enhancing for the c4 type of plants whereas rice is coming under c3 type and also here also because reducing and also uh, the combined increase in temperature and variety, the variation in rainfall also affects the uh, grain, the food grain production and rising temperatures are also nullifies the positive effect. Uh, you can see this is the wheat production in India, as an example, and in next 50 years, it, it, it is tremendously, it is going to reduce, and every one degree increase in temperature, there is a reduce in production, and uh, uh, actually, uh, this can be managed by the 75% of loss of this kind of uh, impact can be minimized by cropping the plant during the seasons, uh, the particular seasons, and the increased droughts also can be uh, uh, increasing because of the uh, high temperatures and cereals productivity also decreasing by 10 to 40 percent where it is expected to decrease during the uh, coming years. And other negative impacts of climate change on agriculture includes increasing temperature, uh, thereby increasing the fertilizer requirement, thereby the nitrous oxide emission increases, uh, which contributes to the global warming and climate change. And increasing the sea and uh, the, the river uh, water uh, temperatures are also affecting uh, the fish uh, fish breeding and uh, the, the migration and uh, harvest and coral reefs also started to declining and increased food, water, shelter and energy requirements for livestock and also drought stress is a major constraint that limit the increases in the vegetable uh, yield. And then the uh, climate change, yes, the, the, well, only two more slides. So okay, climate change across the effect on agriculture so among this carbon dioxide uh, the among, among this the carbon dioxide closely linked to plant growth that yields the grains such as wheat rice mice etc and increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide works as carbon fertilizer which improves the growth and soybean also one example that grows in elevated carbon dioxide and temperatures also reduce crop uh, in evapotranspiration rate thereby the water loss will be minimized this increases the yield of the plant and you can see one example of how the uh, during the elevated carbon dioxide how the plant can grow the here the tomato is taken as a case study and uh, in, in presence of environmental stress such as drought or uh, uh, sunlight etc here with elevated carbon dioxide the plant growth is maximum so, uh, in case of uh, uh, the case studies, uh, so the recent case studies are uh, conducted uh, in Barcelona and other countries in Belgium, and new logs in uh, Albert Canal in uh, 
bladders belgium so they here here because of the reduction in the water level of the canal uh, recently they have managed uh, to maintain the water level and also in case of uh, barcelona tree tempering uh, mediterranean city they are also because of the heat waves so the, the particular government taken initiatives to uh, to plant more trees and nowadays uh, they are uh, in the particular heat waves is being reduced and this particular uh, action taken during the year 2017 is tremendously the heat waves is reducing and uh, expected to get a good climate change during the year 2037 and also in basel uh, in green roots in switzerland also uh, they are planning to their plan already plan to have a green roofs and uh, because of which the now the climate change and the temperature is reducing when compared to previous things so similarly we, in each and every country and the particular place and the, because of the effects they have to have the initiatives to improve the climate change thank you Thank you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you for those um, those remarks, which uh, gave us a good focus on agriculture and um, uh, really sort of highlighted some of the issues that uh, Professor Amma had given us a summary of. So thank you for those. We've now got our final speaker in the to introduce their remarks before we go into the panel discussion, and that's uh, Mrs. Anna Clark from Heriot Watt University, uh, who she is the Sustainability Strategy Coordinator. Um, Heriot Watt have clearly got a strategy around this, and hopefully we're going to hear a little bit more about that, which would be great. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Good afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world this finds you. My name is Anna Clark and I work as Heriot Watt University Sustainability Strategy Coordinator. That means that I assist in enabling Heriot Watt's global environmental strategy, which seeks to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2030 for university operations. Heriot Watt is located on the edge of Edinburgh, which is in southern Scotland, which uh, where autumn is very much set in after yet another summer in which high temperature records have been set. I'd like to extend my thanks to the organisers for the invitation to speak today. It really is a privilege to speak at a conference with such diversity of distinguished speakers spread across the globe. Given that this is the World Technology Universities Network, I, I would like to share with you one of my favourite quotes about society's relationship with technological advancement from the ever insightful Douglas Adams. I've come up with a set of rules that describe our reactions to technologies. One. Anything that's in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary, and it's just a natural part of the way the world works. Two, anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. Anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. And I should highlight at this point that I am 35. I, I feel that this quote is relevant because much of the path to net zero will rely on the development, implementation, and widespread adoption of new technology. And if Douglas is right, this, this won't come easily and we'll all have our parts to play. I realize that this is also a massive overgeneralization, but I think it's a fair assumption to make that for many people, regardless of when they were born, the pace of change required to reach net zero, it's scary and it may feel against the natural order of things. Universities are important sources of answers to questions that people may have about that change. So what is Heriot Watt doing to reduce their CO2 emissions? For measuring and reporting purposes, our emissions are grouped to three categories, or as we call them scopes, which are shown on the slide, for which the arrows are very roughly in proportion to the emissions volumes. Heriot Watt is a global union of Scotland, yeah. Arab Emirates, and a campus in Malaysia. And as you might imagine, the source of all campuses is different substantially across these campuses. For UAE and Malaysia, there's significant demand of like cooling of buildings from a grid that's largely reliant on gas-fired power stations. But in Scotland, it's the heating of buildings that's crucial. The primary source of our heating at present is from the burning of gas on site. However, a high proportion of electricity from the grid here comes from renewable sources. 
2020, for example, was a record year for renewable electricity generation in Scotland, with 97.4% of gross electricity consumption coming from renewable sources. About 70% of that is from onshore wind. As such, much of our net zero strategy at Harriet Watt is based around the electrification of our Scottish campuses, um, and this demands a technological solution. We're in the process of developing a strategy to attempt to transition from our current state of gas-fired heating to the use of electrical air source heat pumps for our Scotland campuses. This addresses our scope one emissions while also considering the implications of the source of our scope two emissions. Scope three remains complex and it takes us back to Douglas Adams and his assessment of society and the challenges of doing things differently. It's likely to be a challenging process and it's one that we're only at the beginning of. While changes to how we operate as a business are in their early stages, Harriet Watt has a long history of developing pioneering solutions to challenges facing society. But we're also a university with strong ties to industries with large carbon footprints. But rather than sever those ties, we're working with those same industries and companies and enabling them to transition their operations to be less impactful upon the environment and to have lower CO2 emissions. I should highlight though that this is a transition and it absolutely will not happen overnight. To give some examples, the development of low carbon jet fuel and the exploration of the subsurface from where oil and gas has been extracted to understanding its potential to store CO2 are just some of the net zero research projects taking place currently at Harriet Wood. We're also focusing on public engagement as a net zero strategy. Education, debate and reasoning among diverse groups with competing interests are key to enabling society to make informed decisions about the environmental impact of individual choices and in influencing a collective action. The individual choices themselves may not seem to add up to much, but by voting with our feet, by demonstrating that as citizens, as consumers and as advocates, we all have the collective power to enable a move to net zero. Over the past year, Harriet Watt has shaped its global environmental strategy and it started putting it into action. Part of this was the running of the Hutton series on climate change. This was a series of six discussion and debate sessions between business leaders, academics, politicians, students and citizens. And it was created to establish 10 key priorities, actions and innovations to mitigate climate change. The Hutton series report will be published immediately prior to COP26, which takes place in Scotland in less than two weeks time. And while it, it's correct that each, indivi it, each individual action is absolutely a drop in the ocean, I'd like to finish as I started this uh, short presentation with a favourite quote from a book that I've enjoyed. And so I'll leave you with David Mitchell's summation that what is any ocean but a multitude of drops? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, thank you for being so uh, concise in your remarks. Um, as a science fiction fan, I'm uh, clearly going to appreciate somebody that opens up their, uh, their presentation with a quote from Douglas Adams. Um, I think what you've really emphasised there is the importance of change but the fact that humanity is not always great with change. And really when we talk climate change, as you said, we are speaking change. Okay, so um, I'd like to open this up to uh, the panel discussion now. So um, I think it might be good. I don't know, Sonia, can you hide, spotlight our panel? That might be helpful. And as we go into this, um, obviously, I would invite any of the panel to ask any of the panel members any questions they might have from those short summaries um, to get some discussion going. I think we're just gathering everybody. I have Amea, I have Anna. Is Preeti still with us? I also have a hand raised, a video hand raised. Fantastic. OK, well, maybe I will mix up a uh, panel discussion with Q&A as we have an audience member who would uh, would like to ask a question. Is uh, Major Mohammed joining us as well? I'm hoping I don't so. think so, Joe. I think it's just how it is. OK. Thank you very much. So I'm sorry, I'm probably going to mispronounce your name, colleague who's joining us. I've got it as Aldurazi. Aldurazi. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and, and ask your question for the panel. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Abdullah Al Garazi, Tahrir uh, University. Um, we, is, of course, thanks all the uh, panelists for their uh, uh, excellent presentation related to the environment and the importance of protecting our environment. Uh, my question, uh, I suppose, cover all the speakers. Um, we know that the United Nations and the High Commissioner for Human Rights and all the reports um, relate uh, human rights to environment and how important to, uh, you know, countries to protect their environment. And uh, we know that more than uh, 100 countries actually to protect environment, uh, it is written in their constitutions. So um, I would like to, um, uh, the panelists, if they can uh, highlight this point about human rights and importance of the human rights and uh, how it can be also important for the people and uh, the environment, clean environment, clean water, and so on. Thank you very much. Um, so panel, can I ask one of you to issue the first response to uh, Mohammed's question there. Please just unmute yourself and, and start the discussion. You know, I'm happy to add a short comment from just the perspective of someone in the UK that there's a lot of talk for the need to combat climate change is, as I talked about is to adopt new technology, to have um, expensive electric heating systems to move from fossil fuel fired car, well, the in internal combustion engine for cars to electric vehicles, but they're all very expensive technologies. And so there's a human rights issue that it's only the middle and upper classes who really can afford to make a transition. And I feel that there's a lot of people who um, are being left behind. And so I think there's um, often discussions missing around how, techn how technology can be affordable to enable everyone to have a right to reduce their impact on, on the planet that we all live on. Yeah, yeah. can I say something? Now, um, of course, this issue of human rights is extremely important. Now, after all, we are talking about climate change and climate change will have an impact almost on every single human being on this earth. We strongly believe in equal opportunity and I talked about inclusive development. We simply mean that you cannot exclude anybody from having access to the resources that we have. Now, uh, we always talk about poverty, inequality and uh, gender gap. And these are all important issues that need to be taken into consideration as far as the climate change and human rights is concerned. Every human right or every human being must have an opportunity to have access to the resources. Unfortunately, we live in a world that it is unjust and unequal. And that's why you see, when you look at the numbers coming from the United Nations, you have the top 20% in, in, in of the population in the world, they own almost 80% of the total wealth. And if you go into, let's say detail, to try to find out how billions of people on this planet, they live in poverty and desperation. This is not because of the climate change. This is because of human action and human greed. And that's why there are lots of injustice that have been done. And I think this um, notion of human right is extremely important. And when it comes to the climate change, unfortunately, mm -hmm. those who will suffer most are the poor, poor people, those who live in the developing countries, those people who don't have access to the resources. And I think the United Nations, the international institution, they need to take this into consideration because ultimately we will never have peace in the world unless everybody involved. And remember that we have only one planet and we live on this planet and we have to share the resources of this planet. And if you are going to exclude some, and if you are going basically to uh, capitalize or monopolize, whatever is there, 
then you're not going to have peace and we're not going to have basically future sustainability as a human. And, you know, uh, today we live in a world that is again, as I said, it is unjust and tightly controlled by very few. You see, that is there. Thank you, Amir, for adding those comments. Um, I was just interested, um, Anna mentioned uh, expensive technologies and, um, I know that uh, Mohammed, you'd mentioned this crowdsourcing idea, which sounded more about crowdsourcing to collect data. Is there something around crowdsourcing around, um, you know, the expensive technologies and things like that? Is there a connection there? Yes, actually, the crowdsourcing is a is a, is a tool to reduce the cost. That's that's what I'm, I'm trying to study because it's available to most people, even in your phone. So social media is available to everybody. So it doesn't probably doesn't cost as much as sensors or other issues or, report, or even human resources needed to inspect and investigate or to monitor. You can use the public to incorporate them into, to help you in the enforcement process. I don't mean enforcement in just, just criminal enforcement, I mean just even in the compliance to make sure everything is okay, they can even monitor and help us to monitor. So the, the main issue I'm trying to tackle with the crowdsourcing is the cost and human uh, resource uh, reduction. And also to incorporate the public, even if you talk about human, uh, human rights, you give them the power, they have the power. They have to, uh, the power to, to express themselves or even report any crime or, or even to follow up the crime gives them some power they feel the power that they have over their rights or, or even their environment I suppose when talking about human rights as well it's important to consider anything new that is developed has a demand on raw materials somewhere in the world I think it comes back to um, comments earlier that it's, it's a difficult conversation to have a, around the fact that a lot of resources are linked to that history of capitalism and colonialism in which um, a lot of the parts of the world where the raw materials for technology are being mined. I, I'm from a geoscience background, so I have an interest in where materials for particularly battery technology are coming from in the world. There are, are human rights issues that exist. I think how do we transition in a way that is just for those that are using it at source so for me here in Scotland thinking okay a lot of the population can't afford this new technology but if we all could it would then replace this huge demand elsewhere in the world so I worked on a topic that looked at mining in East Central Africa and I just I wonder how, how do you balance out to making sure that that whole value chain that whole resource chain for anything that we rely on to um, transition to a lower carbon economy doesn't have human rights infringement somewhere along the way. I think I feel like for for one country to act in a way that we feel is is just and fair on the environment, there is someone else in the world paying the price for that. And how, how do we bring that balance together? Thank you, uh, everybody, for those remarks. Um, Mohammed Al Durazi, does that answer your question? Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And then uh, the panelists have really uh, enriched um, uh, the topic. Uh, it's a huge uh, topic. It's, 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 on, it's actually it's like an, uh, a conference on its own uh, by itself in relation to human rights. But uh, uh, actually, the highlights that the panelists have um, uh, made um, uh, were excellent. And I thank them very much for that and i thank you also uh especially i see that you are from coventry and i live in coventry there and i'm uh, an unwork uh, university graduate so i love them ah, an, an alumni thank you thank you for joining us today now i've seen uh, on the chat that dr litty uh one of our great colleagues in the network has got a question to professor preethi um Litty, would you like to join us? I can't see you on my screen. Yes, Joe, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Thank I hope you. you're Thank well. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for making this session a reality and wonderfully, wonderfully coordinating with Dahlia University. Thank you very much. 
Um, my question is to Professor Preeti, since you were talking the aspects of agricultural activities. Um, just want to um, call the attention that we understand that his pollution, air pollution, a huge amount of it is contributed by the agricultural activities in the neighboring uh, areas of Delhi. Um, what I understand, the farmers are not really that concerned about the climate change when it comes to deal with their livelihood. So they would burn the hay, they would you know, like deal with the agricultural activities because this is their more important, survival is more important compared to the climate change. So how are we going to deal with this kind of situations, these kind of economies that rely on agricultural activities primarily and a large amount of farmers, a large number of farmers are not really concerned about the climate change and the related affairs. Thank you, Dr. Preeti. Yes, thank you for your question, uh, Lily uh, Shibu. And uh, uh, according to your question in Delhi, the air pollution is increasing yeah, dramatically when compared to other states. Delhi is the first place where the air pollution is very high, especially particulate matters and other uh, carbon dioxide also, which is contributing to uh, the global warming. In case of agriculture, this particular carbon dioxide actually helps to grow the plants. But apart from agricultural, but about uh, other other health issues related to air pollution is tremendously increasing and it should be reduced and uh, maybe using uh, the control, source control equipments like pollution control equipments like static, the, uh, the uh, clarifiers or the bio, the filters, back filters or electrostatic precipitators and scrubbers, it should be installed in the uh, in the pipelines or, or the emission directly, the uh, source control is very much important and uh, the government should take necessary action. Actually, uh, several industry, they are adapting this. However, a uh, few uh, small scale industries are not adapting because of which the high air pollution is in the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide is increasing. Apart from that, the major carbon dioxide emission is from vehicular, vehicular, em vehicular emission and it should be controlled the, because the, or each and every human being, they have to take the responsibility because uh, the, every uh, human being, they're having the vehicle and because of this, the pollution is increasing. So it, it is our human rights, that's our previous question related to the discussion. Every human being, they're having the, the rights to do this, uh, to control this, maybe switching over to uh, battery cars or uh, by uh, inserting uh, some control equipment or using the uh, the uh, cars not more than five years. So by adapting such kind of practices, definitely we can reduce the air pollution. I think I have answered your question. Thank you very much. Appreciate. And I understand you were trying to emphasize also on individual responsibility, which is very important. Yes. Thank you very yes. much. Appreciate. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for the question and for the response. Uh, there was a question in the chat while some of the presenters were speaking from Malm Barak. Malm Barak, are you still with us? Malm Barak, would you like to pose the question? Or I can do that on your behalf. So the question was, how far have these things been implemented? And the question was in developed and developing countries. And I think that's that's we've we've talked about this quite a lot, haven't we? Of of what climate change technologies and systems and climate change happenings, and what's being implemented both in the developed world and the developing world. Um, would any of our panel like to comment on that, please? Uh, yes. Uh, now, most of the developing countries, unfortunately, are in a disadvantaged position. They're lacking to the technology, they're lacking to the finance. Now, we have also have to keep in mind that climate change is about science and technology and about innovation. And most of these countries, they don't have the resources in order to be able to become innovative and creative for the sake of developing technologies that can mitigate the uh, climate change. So in uh, general, when we speak about the developing countries, 
they need really help and support. We have been talking about the global action. We talk about the rule of the United Nations and the rule of international institution. And today we live on this planet. And as we mentioned before, that we need to have everybody contribute. And then, as we said, climate change is not concerned of a region or a country, everybody. You see, ultimately, if we're not going to solve the problems of the developing countries, the rich countries themselves, they will be also affected by that. And that's why there is a need for a global action and that you need to involve the developing countries because ultimately the impact of climate change will have, let's say, will affect everybody, both in developing countries and in rich countries. So this is an important question and I think um, we need to uh, somehow go into detail, we need to do research, we need to think about technology, education is extremely important, help, mm -hmm. and that is an And we talked about colonialism and capitalism, and today actually we are still living in that colonial mm -hmm. and uh, capitalist world. And you look at the global trading system, it is also a part of the problem that we today. So that's why uh, the developing countries today are suffering, not because they themselves don't have the resources, but the global economic system itself is not in support of these countries. Um, Preeti, would you like to comment on that from, from maybe from India to, to talk to us from that point? Yeah, uh, so I can say a few uh, responsibilities by individual that can improve the uh, climate change. That means to reduce the global uh, CO2 emission and also to improve the, uh, the particular scenario, thereby we can reduce the climate effect, climate change effects. And then uh, by planting trees, uh, more plantations, thereby we can reduce the carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide, it, it sucks, it sucks, the trees will suck, suck and it uses for the productivity of biomass, thereby we can reduce the, uh, the atmospheric carbon dioxide level in that way and reducing the usage of fertilizers because fertilizer contains nitrogen and thereby it, it, because of the microbial activity in the soil it, it produces it gives off nitrous oxide so that's why it is always advisable to reduce the usage of or to uh, not to use the fertilizers and also to uh, do some sustainable water management such that the topsoil cannot be uh, the flood because of flood. It, it won't be uh, taken off. So it, it is always better to do sustainable water management to have a lake, artificial lake because of uh, the cloud burst or uh, the, 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 because of the sudden rain or uh, more uh, uh, what rain precipitation to avoid the to manage that the sustainable water management should be done in order to save for the top soil because this top soil contains more nutrients that is very much important for the plant growth and also to control the emission of uh, volatile organic compounds especially chlorofluorocarbons fluorides to reduce the uh, globe the uh, the, glo the greenhouse effect and uh, and global warming because temperature is very much uh, uh, having the negative impact because of high temperature all these effects because the, even though the carbon dioxide helps in a beneficial way to plant growth the temperature increase uh, is an it has it has a negative impact over the plant growth as well as uh, melting of snow and rising the sea level etc so temperature control is very much important instead of uh, controlling the carbon dioxide temperature control is very very important so we, we each, each and every one of us, we have to take some necessary steps to reduce the temperature rather thank than you. controlling carbon dioxide. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I can see Mal Mumbawak has raised uh, their hand. Hello, hello, and video has come on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you wish to comment or expand on yeah, your yeah. question? Hopefully I didn't misunderstand. Please, please comment. Thank you very much, uh, Joe and the panel for the lovely discussion. 
Yeah, my name is Munir Al Mubarak from Ahliya University. I am the VP of Admin and Finance in here, Professor in Management and Marketing. Yeah, I, I raised this question, it's a bit general question, and my colleagues answered part of it. But what I meant by this question is that how far the policymakers in countries, developed and developing countries, have really incorporated uh, the issues of climate change into their national strategies, whereby the, the fruitful outcomes coming on the way. That was my, you know, really um, question or, or behind my, the first question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah I, 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 I will try to answer his question. And I'm just thinking about Donald Trump with the Drew from Paris Agreement. He didn't do it by himself, but he did it because of the pressures of the basically financiers, the capitalists, whatever you may call it. You see, I mean, uh, policies are extremely important. And I mentioned that the environment has to be an integral part of any uh, national policy. You cannot basically somehow isolate the environment from your own policies. And we are talking about climate change. And we in this part of the world, climate change almost have an impact on every single aspect of our life. And I mentioned both the fossil fuel and the water. And also don't think about yourself, think about your future generation and children and whether they will be able to sustain themselves in this part of the world. And if you're not going to make decision and initiate policies today, you may not necessarily be able to survive and sustain development in this part of the world. So it is important and it's a critical kind of question and it is the policy maker and decision maker. And again, you need to have an exclusive kind of policies. You just cannot have the government make the decision without the private sectors, without the rest of those. Universities could play a very important role. They can to develop technologies or do research in climate. Education is another critical factor. We are really in this part of the world, like some of the basic, let's say, uh, knowledge and understanding about how do we manage the re water resources that we have in this part of the world. Water management is a critical. Energy, for example, which is an important source of carbon dioxide. And this is, again, we need somehow to do something in order to be able, let's say, to reduce this emission of carbon dioxide and have a clean environment. So uh, policies and national government, uh, private sector, again, everybody has to be part of this decision-making process. Uh, otherwise, if you're going to isolate some and only keep decision-making for one group, you will not be able to succeed. Amir, um, thank you for taking that question on. Um, I think there's definitely something around uh, politics and everybody needing to get involved. I'm really sorry, we've had a, a question on the chat. I can see Gautry Shankar has raised their hand, but I need to draw this session to a close now. We've got our students online ready for the student debate. Thank you all so much for your time today, for your presentations, for answering the questions and for engaging so fully. It's much appreciated. I'm going to hand over the reins for the student debate to Sonia for moderation. And I will sit in the back seat for now, listening really carefully. But thank you all so much. Thanks, Joe, and thanks to all of our speakers and presenters so far. I hope everybody's enjoying the session. Um, and we're about to get even more exciting with our first ever WTUN student debate. Now, please bear with us because we've never done this before. All we know is that we've got a group of passionate students who want to come on and share their views. So um, I hope you all enjoy this. I'd now like to welcome our students. Um, if you could all turn on your cameras so that we can spotlight you so that our audience members can see you all. 
Um, we have two teams today debating um, the statement. Could corporate social responsibility be the way forward to reduce carbon emissions by 2030? So a very interesting topic. Obviously, we've had some views from our speakers so far on who is responsible. So hopefully our students were paying attention. Um, we have two teams, firstly, that team from Alia University, who are today's host, uh, where we have Kothar, Eamon, Arij, Noor and Ahmed. And we also have our international team, which is made up of students from some of our other universities in the network. And that is made up of Sapritha, Charles, Vanitha, Lindsay and Leanne. The debate is going to be very fast paced because we've got a lot of students who've got a lot to say. They've put a lot of work and research into this, so it will be timed um, and I will be timing on my end and I will unfortunately be interrupting when it comes to the end of your um, sort of slot. So please do stop when I tell you to. I'm not trying to be rude. We do just want to get through the whole thing. Um, and also it's part of the challenge to see if you can stick to your times. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll start with two opening statements from either side. We will then have um, um, a bit of time for rebuttals where we'll go forwards and backwards. We will finish with um, questions, which will be given by our judge, who is Lars Anderson, who's speaking from Sovereignary University in Thailand, um, and some closing statements and final remarks. So without further ado, I'm going to get my timer ready. Um, and first, we are going to go to our team that are arguing for the statement, and we're going to go to our first speaker, who is Ahmed. So in three, two, one, go. I would like to greet and thank all the attendees. I start my speech by saying, according to Reuters, 2.3% of the cumulative global companies have adopted some method of CSR 2002. As of 2015, the rate has risen to 48.4%. A significant shift has occurred in the public perception that aims for dire actions and lasting solutions towards an effective method to combat carbon emissions, as well as the other causes and outcomes of climate change. The ways of the baby boomers and Gen Xs has ended. Now step the millennials and Gen Zs to take the initiative. A study from the University of Madrid has revealed that EU entrepreneurs and shareholders have made CSR a priority in their decision making and work to outweigh the organization's social response over the negative impact. Furthermore, the study also shows that investing in CSR has positive effects on growth and profit. This means that current corporations have it in their interest to adopt a CSR program if they want to be sustainable in today's market. Political unions and governments are starting to urge corporations to adopt CSR plans and actions to help and aid the battle against global catastrophes, mainly carbon emission. Examples of such actions in the EU, in the EU's law towards the automobile, automobile manufacturers is that limiting their engines carbon emissions, tax reductions offerings in the US for green corporations and many more. The main message and moral to be acquired from what I said is that corporations are the vital and most important key in our collective global battle. Corporations do hold the most responsibility and the most funds to achieve an everlasting impact on the planet. All this can be accomplished by a CSR agenda. I hope the world is ready for 2030 for it will be the cleanest, freshest and greenest year in decades. All thanks to CSR. Thank you. Brilliant, and kept under time as well. So what a fantastic way to start. Um, brilliant, so now we're gonna to go to our second opening speaker from the Alia team, which is Noor. Well, uh, over to you. Hello, do I start? Um, if I come into your house and start destroying your stuff, would you like it? No, right? So why is it that we all are working day and night to destroy our one and only home, Earth? We all need to realize that greenhouse gases are a serious threat to our planet. We must do something to reduce carbon emissions. Science tells us that the health of our species and the health of many other species on this planet is reliant on us making this change. One way to tackle the situation is through corporate social responsibility. We as individuals do not have enough power to address this issue on, on our own but huge corporations certainly can solve this problem. 
Corporate social responsibility can moderately decrease overall greenhouse gas emissions. Corporate social responsibility is broken down into many categories like environmental, ethical, and economical responsibilities. To name a few, Google, Coca-Cola, and Johnson's and & Johnson's have already implemented CSR successfully. In 2018, Google, Google earned the, the highest reputation institute CSR score by using 50% less energy in their data center compared to others around the world. They also have committed over $1 billion to renewable energy projects. Coca-Cola also supported the cause by collecting and recycling every bottle, making, making their packaging 100% recyclable. Lastly, Johnson's & Johnson's are leveraging the power of the wind to provide safe water to communities around the world. Other companies will certainly follow the example of these giant corporations. And this way, we will be able to reduce carbon emissions at a much more faster rate. Consumers are increasingly likely to abandon brands that do, not, that do not meet their ethical and ecological standards. Companies must put people, planet, and profits at the heart of their strategies. There are absolutely no downsides for corporations being considerate about the environment. You reduce your carbon footprint and help the world be a better place to live at. You save money in the process, and you earn the distinction of being a business that truly makes a difference. Thank you absolutely fantastic opening um once again under time as well so this is going really well as far as i'm concerned so well done to the alien team we're now going to move on to the international team for their opening statement so firstly i'd like to invite sapritha to give her opening statement your time starts now actually the opening statement is by charles okay <laughs> charles your time starts now Okay, um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry to tell you, but um, our team strongly believes that corporate social responsibility or the, or the CSR cannot make it reduce carbon emissions by 2030. I don't think that we can meet the goals of the Paris Agreement if we're just going to rely only with the corporates. Environmental, ethical, philanthropic, and economic obligations are the four basic aims of the CSR. However, um, as evidenced by, this, by their activities, um, they place a greater emphasis on their ethical, economical responsibilities and charity efforts. CSR has been there since 1970s, and when we make two mates look at the carbon emissions since then, it was evident that they have been steadily increasing. That is to say, corporations alone will not be of much assistance in resolving such problems. Therefore, we argue that CSR is not a viable option in moving forward in reducing carbon emissions by 2030. If they are too good, then it should be decreasing, right? We cannot. Uh, we want to argue also that all corporates have this have different focus in CSR. According to Harvard uh, Business Review, all organizations may not engage in the same sort of CSR because it's neither practical nor logical. A manufacturing firm for example, um, may have numerous chances to reduce environmental effects, but a financial services company may find it difficult to do so. And instead, they, they just focus on social efforts and promote financial inclusion and literacy. CSR does not um, prioritize environmental issues, especially at this time. As I previously stated, they're primarily focused on philanthropy or charity staff. Or charity staff. As an example, since the outbreak, um, much CSR in Thailand has focused on supporting the new normal that has emerged as a result of the pandemic. This covers healthcare, COVID-19 pre um, prevention, remote working, or education, um, all of which are important in the country. So thus, their focus in solving environmental issues was diverted to other responsibilities that they have. That's all. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Another great opening argument. And for our final opening statement, we're now going to go over to Sapritha. Yeah. yeah. Hi, review. everyone. Your yeah. time starts now. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I just totally disagree with you and all those people because cooperation is, uh, we don't need cooperation. We can, 
right now we don't need because the reason is I have an example like a couple, a couple from Brazil, they just planted 2.7 billion trees over in 20 years. And when it comes to UCSR, it is not doing anything. The reason because it has been like since 1970, from 1970 onward, 0.0 percentage of carbon dioxide has been increased in our world. It means like 41.4 uh, parts per million. It, it is one of the highest record from for after 400 million years. When it comes to 2060, it can reach 560 pmm. And when it comes to the carbon dioxide, 95 percentage of this carbon dioxide comes from natural sources, volcanoes, and metric ton of vehicles. Uh, 6, 4.6 metric tons of uh, vehicles. It comes from like 4.6 tons uh, tons from vehicles, and 65 percentage it comes from combustion combustion of uh, fossil fuels and uh, volcanoes and decompositions. And the most important point is we, we all know that how population is day by day increasing. When we reach like 2060, the carbon dioxide will increase 560 ppm. It means like 50, uh, 56 mil, uh, billion tons of carbon dioxide, which is so harmful. And from each house per year, 7.5 tons of carbon dioxide is releasing. From since 1970, if uh, yeah the CSR is established in 1970, if it is working so well, I think gradually the carbon dioxide will decrease, not increase in this much level. Literally like 0, 0.0 point means like 216 ppm to 419 ppm, and because of industrial and the main and the main point is 71 percentage of out of 171 percentage of industrial are causing global warming, and out of that 71 percent, lot of companies are under CSR. CSR. So CSR itself like causing some of the global warming gases and CO2. And when it comes to like uh, carbon dioxide, average house is pointing like 7.1. And when it comes to another point that is a major one is deforestating. And you know that like 15 million trees has been cutting per year and one ton of, uh, one ton of carbon dioxide needs six trees per year six trees to absorb that carbon dioxide. And each year, 15 billion tons of uh, trees are being cutting. And, and the more important point is, uh, as they said that CSR is like working on environmental stuff and all those things, maybe they are just working on like planting the trees, but they are just planting the trees. They're not watering the trees and they're not monitoring the trees. And if they have planting since 1917, I think uh, it would be like uh, the 15 billion trees have not been cutted from our world. I believe that. This is my question. Thank you very much. Please take a breath. Um, I'm out of breath just listening to you do that. So many facts and so many statistics. Really, yeah. really happy to see that our students have um, been doing a lot of research for this. So puts us yeah. in good stead. So that was our four opening statements. So thank you to our speakers so far. Um, I bet Lars has already made a lot of notes. Um, we're now going to move into the rebuttal stage of our debate. So what's going to happen now, we will start with the four team and one member will be given 60 seconds to either add an additional point or argue against one of the points made by the against team. And then the against team will have 60 seconds to respond. We will then switch and go against team and then the four team. So now if one of um, the students from the four team would like to raise their hand if they'd like to make the first point and then we will go from there. <laughs> Eamon, brilliant. If you could unmute yourself. And then, Lindsay, we will come to you for the first against. So, Eamon, your 60 seconds start Hello now. and good, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'd like to start by addressing the issue of uh, talking about how many models of transportation we have around the world. We have around 1.4 billion vehicles on Earth, um, and many companies are working with a large budget on research and development to provide better fuel alternatives to reduce or even eliminate carbon emissions. I know this seems to be impossible, but it's actually uh, being accomplished. When the opposing team was talking about CO2 increasing uh, in comparison to the 70s, this is completely normal. I mean, if we consider the number of companies that have opened since the 1970s, uh, the number of companies almost doubled since the 1970s. And if we talk about transportation in the 70s in comparison to 2020, uh, there's a very large amount of uh, population increase, transportation method increments, and companies that opened. And naturally, all of these are giving us some sort of commodity. And that's that 60 seconds. I knew this was going to get interesting. <laughs> um, so the four team will have time to we'll come back to you again. But now we're going to move to the against team. So Lindsay, I think I saw a hand up there. 
Are you and ready we to handle keep? that. I mean, like uh, only the Lindsay should handle. Can we or somebody else can handle? So that? we'll take we'll be taking it in turns, but there'll be sixty seconds, and then we'll come back to somebody else. Okay. So Lindsay, okay. if you are ready, your sixty seconds starts now. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So basically, there are n number of companies, or you know, there are n number of corporates that are coming up. Uh, since you know, one of your teammates had also mentioned about uh, the technology, the resources, but it is just that it is all you know. Uh, uh, I wash kind of thing, I would say, because they promote their brand and not you know uh, they don't really focus on the. And, Worse health effects on people. It all begins with the citizens and not companies because companies don't really help. Because in around the let's say the past few decades, companies haven't helped. Around two lakh uh, fifty thousand lives have been lost, and which was re reported by the World Health Organization. So uh, they did have adverse effects on health, such as you know cancer, malaria, diarrhea, and all of this. So all these could not, uh, you know, uh, be solved by the initiatives taken by the company, by the policies that the government introduced, along in jointly with the companies. So I strongly believe that is a definitive no, in spite of having a lot and of companies. And that's sixty seconds, I'm afraid. So we'll have to stop you there. Um, so now we'll switch it the other way around. So who would like to speak next from the against team? So Preetha, did you have an extra point to make? Yeah, yeah, I have actually. Okay, brilliant. Your time starts yeah. now. Yeah, he just said from 1970, they just built all those things. It means you even said, by yourself, you said that carbon dioxide gra uh, gradually increased and CSR is not working. You yourself mentioned that CSR is not working and a lot of companies were there. Even CSR, uh, I mean, like some of the companies even like uh, uh, adopted their policy, even though they're not working. You, you, I mean, like you just said by yourself that I think so. Okay, short and sweet. And uh, Eamon, you've got your hand up to respond. Is that right? Yes. Uh, I'd like and to address that this is not exactly what we said. What we said, what these are commodities that we cannot stop. I can, you cannot expect a human being to say that I will not drive my car tomorrow. You cannot expect someone to say that I will not be using an airplane to travel to, to my home country. This is something that's reasonable for me to, to address. Now, I can always give you examples of very strong CSR initiatives. If we talk about the United States, such as Microsoft, Google, Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft is completely carbon, carbon neutral. And they're also implementing to be carbon negative by 2030. They're, so they're putting goals based on the uh, Paris Agreement. They're putting goals based on the uh, betterment of the future. Uh, Microsoft has also suggested that all of their customers, all of their loyal partners will be going green as well. They are promoting new technologies. They are promoting new initiatives in order for their consumers and their loyal partners to also get involved. So they are raising awareness in, in other places where governments are not even able to sustain such awareness. And uh, that's 60 seconds. Brilliant, yeah. thank you. I'm gonna go to Leanne next, if that's okay. So yes, Leanne, yes, yes. your 60 seconds start now. So I would like to address what you said that com companies since uh, 1970 have doubled. Shouldn't that be a positive correlation that their step should also double and their effort should also be the same with what they are producing, what they are putting into the market. And companies can, you said companies can stop, uh, we can stop the commodities that people are doing. Then why can't we do something about it then? Why can't we counter interact with that? It is a simple uh, um, science that there, if there is an action, there'll also be a reaction. And we all, you also said that there are companies that are saying, are, are putting goals well, that's what we do right now. We are, all are putting goals. Everyone is, all of us are putting goals, but all we do is talk and talk and putting goals and putting to plan. But what are they doing? Are, they in, are there any action? Are there any significant um, decrease in carbon emissions? Are there anything that you can present to us? Any statistics that since uh, Microsoft, as you said, have put these plans, are there any evidence that these plans are being implemented and are they working currently in our status quo, especially that seconds. what we have our debate until 2030 only? Thank no, you. I, forget, fine. I feel so bad, but I'm going to have to do it. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I think Ahmed wants to respond to that one. What 60 seconds starts has, now. What my colleague has said is that the population also has doubled. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with the population doubling, all the commodities and needs of, of, of the population 
are going to be met by, by the corporation. If you are saying that uh, corporations are the reason, then other than CSR, can I know or can you mention any other uh, way that we can reduce carbon emission? If, uh, and, and we all know that most of the funds are held by the corporation and individuals are not that well funded and government don't have the time to, to tackle the, their, the issue alone. And as well as that, governments need the corporations as channels to address this issue. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of hands up there. I think I saw Sapritha's hand go first. So I'm going to go there first and then Lindsay will come to you. Yeah, uh, I think this is very uh, drastic uh, thing. I would like to say that cooperation, you, he was saying that cooperation, what type of solution we, uh, we have to save our nature, we should uh, it means like we should have self-initiative to plant the trees and to, to stop, uh, to, uh, I mean, like stop doing like minor things like burning plastic or burning woods or using like a lot of vehicles or using like uh, some fertilizers over the land and some soaps. They are using a lot of chemicals that are mixing with uh, water and that are creating a lot of uh, uh, chemical throughout the land and which is causing directly or indirectly for CO2 emission. So when it comes to corporations, he was mentioning like, <clears throat> what type of corporations you are like better than CSR but CSR also not doing anything right that's the point I was telling all obviously the population has increased it means like by 2030 the CO2 will be also increased it means CSR is not doing anything right since down it has been increasing increasing the CO2 is increasing and the population is increasing CSR is not doing anything by no, no, 2030 but it is impossible so much passion um Lindsay are you ready for your 60 seconds Uh, can I see? Oh, I think I might just have lost Lindsay. Okay. In that case, we'll go over to Eamon, who wants to respond. Your 60 seconds starts now. Thank you. So we were talking about self-initiatives. When we talk about self-initiatives, we talk about individuals. What is the power of an individual to afflict change? Let's be realistic here. If we want to talk about figures, we talk about many companies such as Puma. Puma has reduced their carbon emissions by 10,000 tons annually. Apple has has around a 1 billion estimated deal for solar power in California. Uh, we have L'Oreal, an estimated of wastage of 52% has been reduced. Uh, we talk about Johnson & Johnson being completely 100% renewable energy. Again, the, the example with Microsoft and many other, United Airlines has, has went into a $16 billion fund to reduce and lower its carbon emissions through different amounts of fuels. So all of these are examples of strong corporations trying to do a change. What kind of change can we talk about when it comes to individuals? Individuals do not have the financial capacity to do this. Their statement is completely false and we all disagree with it because it does and not have the financial seconds. capacity. Although I'm not sure that was the best place to cut that off. Um, I'm going to try and go to someone different now. So Charles has got his hand up. So I'm going to go to Charles. And then I want Kortha from uh, Alia to get ready because we've not heard from you just yet. So I'm going to go to Charles. Your 60 seconds begins now. OK, so um, as, as what they have understand, um, the solution is individuals. So but for us, it's not the individuals alone, not the corporates alone. It should be a collaboration between the stakeholders. Um, for us, uh, to solve this kind of problem, it should be a collaboration between the government, the corporates, the communities, and the individuals collectively. In, in order for us to make it um, happen, it should be um, all the stakeholders should act. Also, the, you have said that um, um, your com uh, you said that a company um, made this thing happen, but according to the statistics that we found, um, the carbon emissions are still increasing until now. So um how are we going to implement those things um if um if we only have nine years left That's thank all. you Kotha, i'm going to come to you now if you unmute your microphone yes brilliant and your 60 seconds starts now if csr is not the way then what is the way we are giving you now real data that see that csr is making a difference give me another Thing, another uh, like is it individuals is it governments because we have real data from corporations Johnson and Johnson they have 
uh, they are leveraging the wind power and have uh, reduced their carbon emissions by 59% already this year. L'Oreal, they have uh, reduced their uh, carbon uh, footprint by 60% already now this year. We have real data. What do you have? Google, and since 2007, they were the first company to become carbon neutral. And now they, in 2017, they purchased enough solar wind power to match their entire global electricity consumption. And they have invested 150 million US dollars in renewable energy. And they are the first company to neutralize their entire legacy carbon emissions. 60 we have, seconds, perfectly. Oh, it wasn't, but I'm gonna pretend it was. Okay, Lindsay, um, I think you're back, is that right? No, okay. So I'm gonna go to... Um, yes, so I am. Oh, there we go. Okay, brilliant. Your Hello. 60 seconds. Yes, I can hear you. 60 seconds begins now. So I'd like to answer uh, the opponent's question stating that what is an individual's contribution to the control of you know carbon emissions? It is just the minimality of, or you know, say the controlled usage of resources because the resources we have the, especially the renewable resource that we have may run out in the next few years. Instead, alternate technologies will not help because people are fast switching to, I'd like to take the example of electric vehicles, considering a noise-free, a pollution-free and a cost-efficient vehicle, but it's not completely true because EV charging right from its manufacturing, right to its charging, it's gonna involve electric current from the conventional thermal power plants and it's going to produce same metric tons of carbon emission com when compared to the traditional IC engine vehicles. So it is directly or indirectly causing a impact on you know both health and adverse effects on the world economy. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to go to Noor next, who's put their hand up. And then after that, I want to go to Areej because they're the only member of the team who hasn't spoke so far. So Noor, would you like to go next? Your 60 seconds starts now. Yes, I would like to respond to Charles by saying that this issue needs collaborative efforts. And we just want to thank you for supporting our point. Individuals are not able to tackle this issue alone due to the scale of this crisis globally, which is why we're saying individuals, companies, and local SMEs should be involved in tackling this issue through educating, promoting, and initiating these changes. Who's going to be in the forefront of these changes? Corporations. So uh, for example, here we have Apple signed an estimated $1 billion deal with First Solar to power their California sto uh, stores, offices, data centers, and headquarters. Do you think the employees would have been able to do this on their own? Do you think that people, even if they were aware, would be able to initiate these changes on their own. So we do realize it's a collaborative effort. And what we're trying to say that CSR is the way forward. If, if companies address this first, people are gonna follow them later. So, 60 uh, so seconds, thank you. thank you very much. Um, so I just wanna check, um, is Vanitha on the call? She's the other member of the international team can't see you so I just wanted to make sure I wasn't leaving anyone out okay in that case we're going to go to a and then we're going to go back to the four team Areej are you ready to speak if you could unmute your microphone yes uh, I think you're still oh, on mute there we go sure. your 60 seconds starts now okay as the UN also stated our report announcing how we only have 12 keys to prevent that okay so to prevent the devastating climate change and how it's really about time that they need local and global businesses to play a role in climate change. So CSR will never play a role for any corporation or any business because what they do that they invest from their profits, from their earnings. So let's say if they have $1 million this month, they might even have one or two or 3%, which is one or two or $300,000 from their investment. That's still too high. So if all the corporations did the same thing, that's going to be a really huge impact for the environment. Give an example, Ford. Ford Motors, they have a huge planned area of CSR. Their mission to build a better world as they have invested in electrification, $22 billion. It's too high. They aim for vehicles to carbon neutral. It, it, they're not only investing, but also implementing. Give me one corporation that do not use CSR. And that's 60 seconds. Thank you very much. Very passionate. Right. 
I can tell everybody's still got a lot of points to make, but we do have to stick to time. So I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to the next section of the debate is the question section. So I'm, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Lars Anderson, who's our judge for today's debate. And he's first going to pose questions to the four teams, so to the Alia team. And you'll have a couple of minutes to answer that. Over to you, Lars. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I, as I understand it, I will have a little bit of time at the end to give some general remarks. So that's right. Yes. Uh, so here will just be a, a question to, to the team that is pro then uh, CSR. So how do we know that the companies actually will put their their efforts into the right things? Uh, because they're their companies and they have their own interest. Why isn't it better that we tax the companies and, and put this money into the government and there can be a democratic process through which these funds can be used to benefit the society as a whole, instead of trusting that the companies will be doing the, the right things? I think we've got a hand up from Noor there. Would you like to take this one? Uh, do I start? Uh, okay, so you mentioned governments. Uh, we just want to tell you that governments do not have the ability to target climate change on their own, especially governments with low GDP. They're burdened with other issues that they need to address, like uh, offering better education and better health to their people. So climate change isn't really in the forefront of their um, priorities. Uh, plus, there are many uh, companies and agencies that look after these uh, these corporations and make sure that they are doing the right thing. For instance, we have uh, Greenpeace. They, they go after corporations and they make sure that they, they investigate corporations and they make sure that they are implementing uh, ethical practices when it comes to our environment. So we have to disagree with you on this point. Thank you. Great. And Lars, your question for the against team, please. So uh, for you that are, are, are against this, so as I understand it, you don't think that we can trust the government, or oh, sorry, the companies to, to do this and that, that we need to have other ways of doing it. So what would, would that be? And how do you think that, for example, a, a network like uh, WTN can, can actually play a role in this, uh, getting this going? So I think we've got a hand up from Supreeta there. So if you want to take this one, your time starts now. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. First of all, I want to say that individual can do that. As earlier I mentioned, two members from Brazil, they planted over, uh, literally they planted like uh, 2.7 million trees over 20 years, <laughs> where CS, uh, CSR couldn't have done that. Yeah, when it comes to how we can collaborate with uh, Hackathon or W20, the way they are collaborating with us now, they can conduct a survey and they can just ask the people who are interested in this, I mean, like who are really interested in this, like protecting the nature and all those things, uh, they can make voluntarily, uh, they can make them volunteers uh, in their respective countries and they can give them some, uh, some task or something like that. Maybe they can do that, maybe. We're now moving to the final part of the debate, which is our closing statements. So I would like to invite the uh, closing statement speaker from the Alia team, who is Eamon, to start his statement. You will have three minutes to wrap up. Your time starts now. OK, I'd like to wish you all a good afternoon. We are students from Alia University, and we're very humbled to be taking part in this conference. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to, again, stress on the importance of corporate social responsibility. Now, climate change is a responsibility brought forward that everyone can have an effect on. Um, comp and then companies operating in the world have doubled since the 1900s because of globalization and technological advancements. We as people can, on can only see the tip of the iceberg and that's the extent of our efforts. Our budgets are limited, our governments tackling many crises, pandemics rising, companies through corporate social responsibility are able to break that ice. Um, billions of dollars are spent yearly on CSR to raise awareness, provide solutions, and create a high standard in clean production. This has impacted consumers in looking at companies that mirror their ethical standards. It is illogical for me to say that carbon emissions can be solved by shutting down companies or certain activities. As unfortunate as it is, the environment around us is affected by running electricity, transportation, and daily necessities. 
uh, but this is where CSR steps in. Any benefit towards the environment through CSR is a step forward towards the goal from research and development to sustain a better way of production to foundations that raise money towards the cause, even the simple act of raising awareness in the community. CSR through pioneering companies has already made a huge difference in lowering carbon emissions. In the United States alone, companies have been active in the pursuit of environmental changes, with three consecutive years the US showing lower carbon footprints. Companies such as Microsoft, Apple are becoming leading examples of what it means to be carbon neutral. This has triggered many concerned corporates to follow through and do the same. We all need to understand that governments alone are not able to mitigate this crisis, and that's why they need us. In simple terms, a business succeeds because, of, because it provides to its customers and can only prosper by serving them better. I conclude by saying that CSR is considered to be the future of clean environments. It is one of the best practices, and I urge nations to support corporate social responsibility. And thank you. Brilliant, great closing statement. Thank you very much. And for our final statement, I'm now gonna go over to Leanne. Um, if you could just unmute your microphone, you have three minutes to make your closing statement. Your time starts now. Yes, yeah, so good day, everyone. I'm Leanne and I will be presenting our team's closing statement. So in conclusion, our team highly believes that corporate social responsibility will not be the way forward to reduce carbon emissions by 2030. Because one, CSR divides its focus not solely in environmental dimension. The priority depends on several factors, thus putting carbon mitigation, which is our sole debate statement, is mostly not a priority. We keep on saying that the way forward to climate change mitigation is steps done collectively and in coordination, yet CSR programs itself are run in an, in an uncoordinated way. A company's existence depends on fuzz, uh, existence of fossil fuels, the use of fossil fuels. Most companies admit it or not are profits over protection of life. Thus, how could we rely on that as our way forward towards our future? Stopping the generation of carbon emission should be done in the first place in your in the company, yet companies under CSR are still em emitting carbon themselves. And the release of CSR since 1970s has no significant effects in the car carbon emission data trend uh, in the global stage. So here I say that climate affects us all, does the presented solution as a way forward towards carbon emission reduction should be done collaboratively and not solely, not like depend on a pro profit driven institution, a bottom up participatory effort combined with a top-down synergetic approach should be done. Finally, leaning towards the same ways of addressing climate change, such as CSR that was established in the 1970s, will never be a way forward, especially in a span of nine years. Quoting Sir Albert Einstein, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And that would be all for our closing statement. Thank you. Wow, what a way to close. Um, I'd say I can't argue with that, but that's the point of the debate. So uh, there you go. Um, right. So thank you very much to our students. I'd really want to thank you for the effort that you put into researching and also the amount of passion that you've shown up with today. Um, it's really great. And of course, some of you only really met each other a few days ago. So it's fantastic that you've managed to pull this together. Um, I'm going to hand back to Lars now for some uh, feedback and some comments um, and to let you know what he thought. Hey, thank you very much. It was very interesting to, to listening to this debate. And despite it's being quite late in the evening and uh, soon in, in Thailand, I, you managed to keep me awake, which is good. Uh, so and I, it, it is difficult to debate. And I see that it might be so that some of you are believing more or less in, in your you know, what you're debating. And of course, it's always easier to debate for something that you really, truly uh, believe in than to be giving a topic and to be giving a side in a debate where you might not be 100% uh, sure. And I also think that when I, I listen to this debate, it's like, is this really a thing which is for and against? Uh, does one thing exclude the other? No, is no. Even if we know is CSR, is that the only way to go? No, it's probably not the only way to go. But would it be good that we should we outlaw companies from doing CSR? Probably will also not be a very good way of, of, of getting things going. But I think you you both decides you had you had good good arguments. Uh, you built your up your arguments quite well. And I think one thing I think you should really think about is to focus on what was the question because once in a while we I think we drifted away a little bit on things that are not really 
core and when we have short time it, it is important to focus on 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 the real subjects and it's not always how much you say you know uh, there were, were a few of the the the, the, the parts of the debates where, which was a lot of information it was a lot of facts uh, and and I, I just feel like it oh no I, I'm trying to understand one of the facts and then I get more facts in my face uh, so it's not about showing as many facts as possible it's not pick the ones that are really strong because uh, then I will remember that and listen to that if you give me too many facts at the same time uh, no I don't I will not remember after it afterwards which was the one that I really should no, it really had an impact uh, or could have had an impact on this. Um, but generally, I think you, you know, you made good efforts. Uh, you hadn't had so long time to prepare for this, as I understand it. Uh, you are teams all over the, the, not all over the planet, but in, in quite different uh, countries. So uh, I think you made a good, really good, really good job uh, for what you did. Uh, and uh, no, I, I learned some new things and it made me think a little bit about CSR. I have not been thinking so much about CSR, I think, uh, before. Uh, I know it exists. Uh, now I got a little bit clearer picture of, of what it is, but I also understand that and see the weaknesses of CSR, which was the reason for my questions to the to the to the four group. Because and I think that is also one of the things that the, the against group was saying. How do, how can we trust that these corporations actually are doing the right things? Now, if, we, if they've been going on for so long time, why are not the, the you know why is it not reduced? Uh, and it's not always so easy for companies to do the right thing. So how do we make sure that they actually do the right thing, for example? Uh, so, but thank you very much. It was very interesting to, to listen into. Uh, and uh, it, I think it actually is very good training and practice for you because this is what your life will be about in the future. You know, it's, it's, not, and it's not about being right. It's actually about making sure that other people believe that you are right. It doesn't matter if it's about the environment, if you're an entrepreneur selling your innovation or whatever it is, it's about making people believe. So continue to practice arguing for things that you believe in. Fantastic. What a sentiment to finish on then. So again, well done to all of our students. Absolutely fantastic work. Like Lars was saying then, some of you only just met the other day. Some of you were only given the statement the other day, uh, but it didn't show at all. So well done, and uh, we hope you continue to join in with these sorts of and other WTUN activities um, that happen all around the year. Um, so that's it for the student debate. I'm now going to hand back over to our session chair, Joe, uh, Joe Dobson, even, uh, for some closing remarks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Wow. Well done, student debate team. That was fascinating to listen to, most definitely. And some great feedback there from Lars. I think I would agree that sometimes it's uh, maybe just uh, focusing on a few key points, which some of you did amazingly well. And all of you just showed such passion there, such passion. It was fantastic. It gives me it gives me hope for our future and that's what i've heard today what i've really heard today is a lot of passion from all of our speakers and our students a real recognition of the need for change and the role that everyone needs to play in affecting that change we've talked about politicians possibly with a little bit of doubt companies universities individuals us and, you know, that brings me back to me. And I think whenever I think about climate change or issues like that, I always like to think it starts with me. And that's how I feel today. I feel empowered to go away and, and start that today. So I'd like to say uh, a big thank you again to Alia University for inviting me to chair this session. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been a, a great change for me this week in my work, and it's always good to engage in such a positive way with the network. So thank you for that. I'd like to thank all of our speakers. It's been wonderful. You've all put a great deal of effort into making this a useful and interesting session. So thank you all very much for that. I'd like to give a very big shout out to Sonia and Genia, who do all the work in the background to make these things happen, who've been spotlighting our speakers, and there they are. In fact, go on, spotlight both of you two. Go on, do it, do it. Give us a wave. 
they're absolutely super and they keep this network running um, so well, so well. And I know it's taken an awful lot of effort to make the, the Congress happen again in this virtual environment we're still in. So well done, well done to you all. And once again, good grief, student debate team, big shout out to student debate teams. I love it when our students get involved. It's one of my favorite things about this network. We do events for our wonderful leaders in the university, but we do an awful lot for our students. And let's face it, they are our future. So well done, everybody. And um, thank you also to all of you that have joined us today. I think, um, I hope you've got a lot out of the session. Thank you to everybody that's asked questions and um, go forth, go forth and engage with the climate change agenda. Do what you can do as an individual. And thank you very much. It's been great to have you all with us. A big thank you, Joe, Zinia, Sonia, everyone. Big thank you from Ahle University. <laughs> thank you, Litty. Thank you so thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. <laughs>